Good morning. My name is Eve Bird. I'm the director of the mental health program, and I want to welcome you back to the 25th annual Rosalind Carter Georgia Mental Health Forum. We're so glad you chose to join us today, and I hope your day is off to a good start. And we want to make, we want to help ensure that and make sure that it continues that way. So at this point, I want to introduce my colleague, Stady Bajer Lighty. Senior Program Associate with the Carter Center Mental Health Program Global Behavioral Health Team. Sadie is a certified yoga instructor who will begin our time together today by leading us in a mindfulness exercise. Take it over, Sadie. Thank you, Eve. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Sadie. I'll be guiding us through a brief mindfulness practice over the next few minutes. And the intention of this practice is really to gather us all in this present moment, together in this virtual space, together for the second day of the Georgia Mental Health Forum, and together on the 21st of May, which happens to be World Meditation Day. So before we begin, please take a moment to identify any nearby distractions in your immediate physical space. So that might be your cell phone, computer screen, something that has the volume on and try to place those distractions away just for the next few moments. So maybe flipping over your phone, turning the phone on silent. You can even turn away from your, your computer screen and listen to my verbal cues rather than watching my face. From there, please find yourself in a comfortable seated position. If you're standing and you would prefer to continue to stand, that's okay as well. If you are finding a seat, take a moment to find a bit of length in your spine, releasing and relaxing your shoulders down away from your ears. Gently closing your eyes or finding a soft gaze and finding your feet planted gently on the earth if that's accessible to you. Taking a deep breath in through the nose and a full breath out through the mouth. We'll begin to inhale for the count of four, three, two, and one. Holding at the top of your inhale for four, Three, two, and one. Beginning your exhale for four, three, two, and one. Holding at the bottom of your exhale for four, three, two, and one. Releasing that breath, returning to your natural breath, and beginning to draw your awareness to any physical body sensations that you're experiencing. This could perhaps be a feeling of tingling. It might be the feeling of your sits bones against your seat, maybe an article of clothing against your skin. Noticing any of these sensations as they arise and then letting them go without allowing anyone to linger for too long. Meeting these sensations without any judgment or expectation of what you should be feeling, just become aware of them as they come. Beginning to expand your awareness outside of your physical body, starting to open up your other sense doors. You may start to notice nearby sounds, perhaps the sound of a bird chirping outside, some nearby traffic, a family member or a pet. You may sense a taste or a smell. Being aware of what it is that you notice and letting it go. Allowing this practice of becoming aware of your physical body sensations and your other senses to draw you into this present moment. Returning now to your breath, taking a full inhale through the nose, and then exhale through the mouth. Knowing that you can use your breath as a tool to guide you back to this sensation of present awareness at any point during today's forum, or the rest of your Friday or your weekend. Gently opening your eyes, returning to our virtual room. Thank you all, have a great second day of the Georgia Mental Health Forum. Back to you, Eve. Thanks so much, Sadie. I want to remind you all that the forum is being recorded. Microphones need to be muted unless speaking because of closed captioning being used. And the event is being live streamed on the Carter Center website. Moving into our next conversation or first conversation of the day, 
We all know that housing and supportive housing are critical to recovery and has been recognized as a significant area of need in our state, Georgia. At this time, I want to introduce to you all Bakari Savage, 2020-2021, Rosalind Carter Mental Health Journalism Fellow to facilitate the conversation regarding Georgia innovations and supportive housing. Again, your thoughts and questions are very important to us. During and after the conversation, please put your questions in the chat. At this time, I encourage you to pull your chat up and kind of move it to the side of your screen um, where we will capture these questions. And then we have asked Georgia Supportive Housing Association, Housing First Coalition, and the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities Supportive Housing Advisory Committee, SHARE, to respond to your questions. Your questions and the responses will be posted in the Carter Center Georgia Mental Health Forum page of the Mental Health Program website within the next several days. So I encourage you to go back there to reference um, the discussion and answers to your questions. So without further ado, Bakari, it's all yours. Thank you. Eve, thank you very much. Again, welcome to day two of the 25th annual Rosalind Carter Georgia Mental Health Forum to address a national vision for transforming mental health and substance use care and access to care in Georgia. Again, my name is Bakari Savage and I am a proud 2020-2021 Rosalind Carter Mental Health Journalism Fellow. It is my pleasure to moderate today's panel. Um, before we begin, I'd like to share a quote with you from a book that I just finished reading, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Quote, when we strive to become better than we are, everything around us becomes better too, unquote. Over the next 50 minutes, we will have a conversation, Georgia Innovations and in Supportive Housing. I'd like to right now introduce our panelists, beginning with Sam Simbaris, Chief Executive Officer, Pathways Housing First Institute, Maxwell Ruppersburg, Director, Office of Supportive Housing, Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, and Chris Johnson, Director of Communications Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network. Now, this is going to be a very casual conversation. Um, of course, we are always looking for solutions because we want to be better. Um, this is not to say that everything is wrong. And to begin, I'd like for Sam to, to share a success story with us. Sam. Okay. Thank you very much, Bakari. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I, I'm honored to participate in this Carter Center event. And uh, the story that uh, uh, I'm going to tell is a success story about uh, not one individual, but a, about a way of helping people. And, and I can't think of a, of a more appropriate uh, placement for this or, or setting for this than the Carter Center, given Rosalind Carter's commitment to mental health and President Carter's commitment to housing through Habitat for Humanity, because the story I'm going to talk about is Housing First, which is a program that I developed uh, a couple of dec decades ago now that uh, combines housing with services in a unique way that has proven remarkably effective. So. I guess the first thing to say about it is who, who is this program for? And it does target not everyone, although it can be applied to everyone. It, it was specifically designed for people who were homeless and also suffering with severe mental health problems. That was the group that it, it's only about 20% of the entire homeless population, but in the public's mind and in all of the way that we think about homelessness, the solitary individual on the street, that's who was the target of this group. And the program is called uh, Housing First, but it really is a bit misleading because the program doesn't start with housing. It starts with the relationship that one builds with the person on the street. It's a best thought of as probably a complex clinical intervention, you know, community-based that includes housing. 
So why, why are people on the street and why does housing first work uh, effectively for those that other programs have failed? Now, there's another approach. I mean, the traditional approach, I just need to outline that a little bit so I can explain why housing first, because it's different from the traditional approach. The traditional approach is to assume, like we do, that people who look so vulnerable and so uh, disorganized on the street are not able, are not capable of helping themselves. And so we designed a system that is driven primarily by case workers or social workers or psychologists or psychiatrists, you know, the, the, the mental health social service system guides people through a series of steps, assuming they have to be sober, they have to be in mental health treatment and offering housing as a reward for getting their life together. This program works okay, but it leaves a lot of people out because the recovery from mental health and addiction, as we all know, is not linear. People do okay and they fall back. And if you tie housing to recovery, people keep relapsing. And because the housing is connected to it, they end up back on the street. So what did we do that was different? Seeing all of this repeatedly, we had to change fundamentally our own approach to how we, uh, how we spoke with people and how we allowed them to participate in the treatment. Housing First is really a person-centered program. We engage people by asking them what it is they want. Um, maybe this is a, a corny analogy, but it comes to mind because there's so many graduations going on now and I attended one recently at high school and people were asking all the graduates like, oh, where are you gonna go to school? Which is, you know, already an assumption that uh, the person has decided to go to college and, and move ahead. And similarly, someone who's homeless, it's like, okay, can I take you to the shelter? Can I take you to treatment? Can I take you to detox? Housing First doesn't ask, where do you go to school? Housing First says, so you've graduated. What is it that you're going to do now? That's a very different question. It doesn't make an assumption that you know what the person is doing. And similarly, when you're approaching a person who's homeless, don't assume you know what their priorities are or what their most urgent needs are. And that's what we did. So we ask them, the, the, the subtlety of asking puts the direction of the program and puts the decision-making authority of the program squarely into the hands of the person who's going to be most affected by the program, the client. Not surprisingly, everybody says they want housing first. And that's how we started this program. Not because we thought housing was a good idea, but because the people we were asking thought housing was a good idea. So we went from treatment first to housing first, housing first, but then of course, treatment and support followed. People didn't have to earn housing. It wasn't offered as a reward. It's offered as a matter of right. We operate the program as if housing is a basic human right, and we advocate for that. And we're really focused on not just stabilizing the person, but continuing to work with them towards their recovery. Program works remarkably well. You know, 80% uh, housing retention rate for a group that we once thought were incapable of even making their own decisions. Not only can they make their own decisions, but they can succeed in housing and integrating into the community. That's the other part of it, that the housing is not in a building or programmatic, large scale institutional. It's really people's individual apartments for the most part. And they have a lot of say so in which one they will choose. And, and really they have the sense of participating in a program that's helping them put a home together rather than being placed in housing. So uh, the studies have been very strong, 40% uh, in the traditional approach, housing stability, 80% in housing first. And that's a success we haven't seen with many interventions in the housing and mental health business. Sam, thank you very much for sharing that. One of the things that stood out um, to me is that you said, you know, recovery is not linear. So I'd like to open this up to the other panelists as well you know, we all recognize that housing is important to recovery. So can you clearly define and bridge those two, that recovery is not linear and the importance of housing to recovery? Well, 
Was that a question for me, Bakari? It, I, I'm opening well, it up to all of them. Right, answers. that's what I thought, yeah. Hi, uh, I will take a stab at it. Um, you know, the, you know, housing is fundamental to everything that we do, uh, you know, for our safety, health, welfare, wellness, you know, it's all connected and people outside of the recovery and wellness work that we do, you know, tend to think of that uphill trajectory of progress when really recovery can look more like that. And you know, having a safe place to land when we're coming back from a swoop is incredibly important. Um, having, um, knowing that there is in fact a safety net there, right? And because we talk about a safety net a lot here in Georgia and like in most places and, you know, housing is, you know, just, you know, to us as the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, one of our biggest priorities, one of the things we do at the network and have done every year for the past 30 years, except for 2020, because 2020 is at our annual summer conference, we identify the five top priorities for Georgia's consumers of behavioral health services, right? They vote on these, it's a I can't vote that goes on for a while actually, but in the end, we narrow it down to five top priorities that we share with the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities and all the state agencies. So everyone knows this is what Georgia's community of people in behavioral health recovery have identified as their greatest needs. And housing is always in the top five, always. Some other things have moved out over the years, which is great. Like 30 years ago, there were still people being treated not so nicely, we'll say, in Georgia's public behavioral health system. But guess what? Fortunately, that's changed. That's nowhere near the top five anymore, you know. But housing stays because it is a persistent problem that is difficult to fund and difficult to realize in different because housing is so community specific, right? Like finding a housing solution in Atlanta is going to look a lot different than finding a housing solution in Cordial or Cochrane, right? So for us, it just continues to be and probably will continue for a while to be a top priority to have solved. Maxwell, I saw you shaking your head. Um, what would you like to add to this? Um, well, I'd echo everything um, Chris has said. And, you know, housing represents a really critical starting place for people's journey and it's not necessarily the starting place but it is a launch pad right so it's not the end of the road um but as chris and sam mentioned it is a safe base right it is maslow's hierarchy right like people need a safe living environment and that has to be a priority for us to provide and each person has their own individual you know pathway to recovery to follow the require different levels of support, um, different types of support, and, and they have their own different environments and resources. Uh, all, everyone needs safe and secure housing. It, you know, I view housing as a human right. Uh, and it's, you know, my privilege in this role to try to help provide access to housing. Um, but we do, we are incorporating uh, increasingly, you know, a recovery oriented systems of care approach to our programs because housing is an integral part of the equation, uh, but it needs to be coupled with much more, right, um, to really support the, the long term success of the people that, that are entering um, the housing, especially with, you know, with our program in particular. Sam, would you like to contribute anything? Yeah, well, I, uh, just to uh, maybe add or uh, to some of the comments already made, which, uh, you know, Chris initially brings out this idea of what it was like 30 years ago. And, and I want to say that where we are in mental health today with mental health and housing in the community, giving people choices, even talking about recovery for people with severe mental illness at the level we're talking about it, you know, Maxwell's talking about it at the Georgia Department of Mental Health. Georgia Department of Mental Health has been around for almost 200 years, running huge institutions 
you know, I mean, uh, one of the first psychiatric institutions was in um, um, Milledgeville. So, it, you know, it's a long history. And we're just at the very tip in the last 30, 40 years, are we talking about people living in the community and uh, being able to recover? You know, we initially thought mental illness was a lifelong illness. So we've learned so much in, su in such a short time uh, about, about recovery. And the, to reference uh, Maxwell's point about Maslow, when someone is on the street homeless, it's not about recovery, it's about survival. Everything in their day-to-day -day life, from the minute they wake up to the minute they go to sleep, to where can I eat, where am I safe? It's, it's like you're on the, you're, it's automatic, almost instinctive behavior. When you get home, that shuts down, that autonomic nervous system, you know, survival activity can relax. You can lock the door, you're home, you feel safe, then you can think about next steps. So you can't really talk about recovery without housing because housing is, is sort of the bedrock that allows you to feel safe enough and calm enough to think about the next step. Sam, I think that's fantastic pointing out that you know, when you are in survival mode, how can you focus or concentrate on anything else? It will, you know, over this past year, there has been an outside factor. That outside factor is that of the pandemic. Can anyone, or rather who would like to speak to how that has exacerbated the situation? Um, I can certainly speak to some of the challenges that we've had in Georgia, and I think they're probably not, you know, unique to, to Georgia by any means. Um, it has made outreach more challenging. Um, it has made basic things like appointments with apartment housing providers more difficult. Um, it has resulted in other institutional delays that create barriers, and it just creates a kind of domino effect. Um, Social Security Administration really slowed down uh, with a lot of state offices being shut down. There were increasing difficulties with people getting IDs or birth certificates from other states or even in-state. It's already a challenge getting them from other states. Um, really kind of every governmental function got bogged down. Um, and all of, you know, we've all experienced all of life's basic activities got that much more challenging and dangerous. Uh, meanwhile, people were already in the most vulnerable situation that, you know, we can imagine. Uh, and then we have layered this on top, right? Um, those are also the, the people with the least access to any of the resources that are being distributed in communities. Um, so they've been the last to benefit um, from any kind of aid. And, and of course, not enough uh, aid and relief has, has reached people yet. And, and even just now, you know, this is just a matter of fact of government. A lot of the money that had been given to states is kind of just now arriving, right, in full force and people are planning. And so, you, you know, we've heard about some of the relief efforts, but, but there's a delay. Um, and people who are already without any resources are suffering the most as a result of that. Um, the work continues, like it, outreach has continued, people have continued to get housed, but every part of it has gotten more difficult um, and, and, you know, put the individuals themselves at greater risk uh, and created risks for the providers who are working on the front lines. Yeah, and I'll just add in here that, you know, we don't actually know yet what the full ramifications are of the looming foreclosure and eviction tsunami that's coming at some point, right? And like, we know it's coming, we just don't know when. The Atlanta Regional Commission has done some great work sort of trying to forecast that, but no one has exact numbers, right? Because so many um, landlords are just like, you know, normal people. Most rental property in the U.S. is not the big corporations. It's sort of mom and pops who own like two or three rental properties. And we don't really have the data to know exactly what it's going to look like, but we know it's going to be messy, right? We know there are going to be a lot of people experiencing being put out of a home for the first time in their lives. 
And many of them know that, right? So they're living in this fear of this economic insecurity, you know, as well as the pandemic. And there's also this other part of the population that want like 20% of people who became or experienced COVID as an illness themselves who received their first mental health diagnosis as a result of their um, COVID diagnosis, right? So there are all of these things piling on together at the same time. And, you know, from where we sit, you know, we need to be doing a lot of preparation, a lot more preparation, including especially the housing um, to make sure that as the foreclosure eviction tsunami comes that we have a plan as a state for how we're going to support people, um, not just with housing, but you know that emotional, mental health piece that's so deeply connected to housing. And Chris, I'd like to pick up on something you just mentioned and also something Maxwell, you talked about, the observation made that outreach has become more challenging. Uh, you know, little things like it's difficult to get appointments and you know, that no one single agency is responsible for housing issues. So, you know, how, what work is being done to bridge, collaborate, and, you know, try to sort of pick up the pieces so that this isn't happening, but also looking forward to Chris, what you just mentioned, what is being done to mitigate these foreclosures that, that are on the horizon? Um, I can talk to the collaboration piece, at least the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities and Maxwell can share some information more, I'm sure, than I can. Um, but the SHARE Committee, which is a group of stakeholders put together to share information and just to keep us focused on housing, right? And we were meeting monthly at the Carter Center because, of course, the Carter Center supports these initiatives so much. Um, and we were making and continue to make good progress in just sharing information about what's needed where and the barriers and the successes. Um, sharing that on an ongoing basis is um, important to us. And I really look forward to being back in a room with all of our share participants um, because I feel like we were and continue to make good progress, especially compared to like even like three years ago, five years ago, you know, like, are we all at the table together? And I say, you know, we have been recently and that's been really powerful for us. Maxwell? Yeah, so there is really a lot of um, exciting collaborative work that's that's been going on in the last year. Um, and it was being initiated before COVID, COVID didn't really help anything um, because it put everyone on the back step, but um, those conversations have continued and COVID's really only helped to underline the importance of that uh, cross system collaboration and communication. So we have been working, you know, for years, we've been closely working with DCA um, through this program and, and our efforts to get people to supportive housing. Um, whether it's the Georgia Housing Voucher Program or a program administered by Department of Community Affairs, where a lot of the federal dollar programs come in for housing, HUD, HUD housing. Um, that, is, that is like a baseline level of collaboration that should be happening. But we have been building even stronger relationships um, and we have partnerships with the DOC and the DCS to try to help with reentry. Uh, that is an area where there's a lot of room for improvement, but the agencies are, are working on it. Um, and one of the big conversations happening is around data sharing and the ability for technical systems to communicate uh, because you have these, these silos of data about people that determine their eligibility for programs or benefits, determine, uh, reveal data about, you know, their experience or whether they've had a medical or judicial, you know, event. Um, so exploring conversations around how we can allow those systems to actually communicate and open up to create a holistic and comprehensive picture and approach to serving people so that there's not a big, you know, 
um, gap in information when it's another state agency. And the, the question that's being asked and rightfully is why can state agencies not collaborate and communicate? And the, the answer is that they can, right? And, and right now it's just always a matter of will with state agencies and the will is there, right? The desire is now there. Um, I can't speak to the past, I wasn't around for the past, but there is a real energy right now amongst a variety of state agencies and local system stakeholders, especially in Atlanta, uh, to collaborate and really systemically change the way that we've approached communication and integration of homeless service systems and behavioral health systems, which has really been needed. And people have been acknowledging it and aware of it for years and wanting to get there and, and right now we're really engaged in a, a process of taking the steps to get there, um, which I think is really exciting. And we're not there yet, right? But um, we're actually on our way, I think, um, and believe and, and hope. And I am continue to be optimistic um, about that. Thank you, Maxwell. And Sam, I saw you shaking your head a lot. I'd like for you to uh, start off answering this question when it comes to you know, creating that model paradigm. Give yeah. us examples of what Georgia is doing that other states, um, as well as, you know, places outside of the U.S. can can follow. And I um, specifically reference that because um, Rona Topaz, I hope that I'm pronouncing the name correctly in our chat, um, it raised the question of, you know, relevance to people outside of the U.S. And I think, you know, it goes back to the, the model of the wheel, you know, the hub and the spoke and, you know, creating those paradigms for that could work in other places. Yeah, I, I, I will try and address that. I, uh, the ideal model does exist and we have plenty of evidence of it in the United States. But just to, uh, just to piggyback, if I may, on the COVID conversation, because I think Chris and Maxwell have articulated the challenges that this epidemic has, but there's a, there's a kind of a perspective that I had also about this epidemic that was a little uh, kind of uh, mind blowing, frankly, because you know when you think about um, the advocacy for housing first, which is let's get people off the street because it's not safe. It's you know you, they need to go right into housing and we can get treatment later has been an uphill you know, push and, and a battle in, in many ways, okay? Now we have this little virus, COVID-19 comes along and everybody, not just the housing advocates or housing first advocates from the governors to the mayors, to the advocates, to providers, like let's get people off the street and into these empty hotel rooms. Let's get everyone in here right now. They, they weren't calling it exactly housing first, but it's exactly what they were doing. You know, so the, 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 the pandemic, strangely uh, woke everyone up to the fact that it's unhealthy and unsafe to be out there. We got to get people into safe, secure places of their own. I thought that was kind of an amazing thing how this was accomplished. I mean, in some states, you know, the uh, level of vacancy in the hotel hotel was huge. People placed six, eight, you know, 10,000 people just like that, just like that, you know, from the streets. It was like, we can do this if we want to. And if there's a reason and a compelling reason, and we're all on the same page about it, which for me, actually, that's the whole takeaway and ties directly into Maxwell's point about collaboration. We have failed in homelessness more than every other country, Western country, you know, to Rona's point about international perspectives. The countries that agree, uh, you know, about an approach a funding mechanism, a philosophy, and they don't argue, no, they need shelter. No, they need to earn their way back to housing. They got to demonstrate that they're ready. No, put them in, housing is right. We have multiple voices in homelessness, like we had the multiple voices in the last administration of the pandemic. Wear a mask, no, it's my freedom. No, the science says this, no. You know, and when, there's, when we have a cacophony of voices no unified direction, you have more people homeless on the streets of the United States than you do in pretty much every other country, Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, the so-called Western countries, because we have less agreement and we have a much thinner safety net because we're 
afraid to invest in anything that looks like government is getting involved in social problems. Government in the United States only gets involved in banking problems primarily because they're too big to fail. But homeless people, they're tiny and they can fail many times. You know, there isn't, oh, this is not political. I'm sorry, just a little tangent there. But, you know, it's all about income disparity. It's about racism, fundamental. 40% of people who are homeless, people who own 40% are African-American, only 15% of the population. So these disparities are, you know, deep. Models that work also exist and this, this uh, leading the way, Georgia, in this collaboration, because I think there's a, an awareness through this pandemic and, and from the years of frustration that we need to do things differently, changing coordinated entry, changing our approach to uh, you know, housing first and then services. There has been in the last decade in this country an unprecedented and very effective approach to housing veterans experiencing homelessness because there was a decision 10 years ago that veterans are a deserving group. You know, there's a, there's a moral and ethical issue too about deserving and undeserving poor. But veterans crossed the bar in this divided uh, government and everyone agreed that veterans should, coming back even as early as the Vietnam, but in Gulf One, Gulf Two, you know, there's been many wars and many veterans, 70,000 on the street. HUD and the Veterans Administration at the federal level, put together money for housing and money for support services and created this hud Bash program. And now today, we have a 56% reduction in veterans homelessness and over 70 cities have ended veterans homelessness altogether. That's extraordinary. This is in the same United States that doesn't agree about things, but it shows you when we do agree and a powerful agreement among major agencies, we can accomplish incredible things. Maxwell, would you like to uh, to add? I mean, I agree. You know, uh, I agree totally. It it pushed us as governmental agencies to rethink what we have been doing, right? And accept that extraordinary measures were needed. Um, they had been needed, right? Um, people have been ringing the bell on the housing emergency for some time. Um, as well as the emergency of homelessness, right? And I think that it's telling um, that when we look at the response to COVID, um, what has worked for the U.S. and now has it outperforming its Western counterparts, um, where it had not been before, was a major injection of capital um, to support initiatives. Uh, that is ultimately the way that we're going to address these problems is treat them as an emergency and respond to them with the resources that an emergency really demands. Um, and again, that's not a new message, but we see that that works when we really treat it as something that is a crisis. Um, we can dramatically change the situation. Um, and the important thing I think is that we don't lose, you know, the energy and the clarity of mind that this crisis can give us, right? A, a crisis is an opportunity for change um, because it disrupts the status quo. Um, so I hope that we're able to, you know, grow from this, this moment. And I hope that it proves to be a moment in history and, and is not, you know, new reality, but um, yeah, that we really take the lessons to heart and start responding uh, to homelessness and social challenges uh, and our social safety net uh, the same way that we respond when there's a pandemic, um, because there's been a pandemic of behavioral health issues for some time in America, it's just been going unnoticed. Wow, that was a pandemic of behavioral health issues. Maxwell, both you and Sam brought up some great points. Collaboration, capital, emergency status, items that uh, are needed to, to address this. Let's have you clearly define the barriers for Georgia to be successful. And 
clearly define as well what help is needed to be successful so that we can push the dial and begin to shift the conversation. So I, I will jump on that. Hi. Um, in my mind, and I'm speaking as citizen Chris Johnson here, not representing any organization. Um, it really is a matter of priority. Like, you know, what matters most at the highest levels of state government and not just the current gov leadership, governor, legislative bodies, but, you know, going back decades, what matters at the Georgia Capitol? And lots of things matter, but as much as we say it, I don't think it's housing first. You know, who runs on that, right? Lower taxes are a great thing. Um, I enjoy them. It's one of the benefits of living in Georgia, right? But these other things matter too. Behavioral health matters. Housing matters. And if it really was a priority for our leadership, um, things would look a lot different. You know, that peach logo you see at the end of every film that's made in Georgia, right? Georgia wants to take ownership of that. They want to be proud of that for accomplishing that and being a leader in that. If that same energy, money, and time was dedicated to making sure Georgians are living in safe places, um, this state would look totally different. So I think it really is just about, you know, priorities. Some other states do different things. I don't know that any state addresses it the way I would like to see it addressed with all that passion, but um, there are steps you can take. Like, you know, Texas has done some recent work you know, around the uh, eviction crisis that, you know, really strong leadership at the state level. You know, meanwhile, Georgia has a trust fund for the homeless that is incredibly small and is frequently at risk for going away entirely. So, you know, putting our money behind our values as Georgians, I think could go a long way to creating a better, safer Georgia for everyone. Sam? I, uh, I, I, I completely agree. I'm smiling a little bit about the money because I, I think that, uh, and Chris, I, 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 I'm interested in your response. I don't think we can have it both ways. I don't think you can enjoy the low taxes of Georgia and at the same time insist on the government spending more money on housing and mental health services. It's like we have, we, all of us have to collectively uh, kick in you know, and buy into this idea that people who have a lot should pay a lot more and those who have moderate should pay moderate and those who have low or nothing need help from those of us that have more. I mean, there's a fundamental social contract that, you know, uh, I think we, we have not fully resolved. And, and I'm not advocating for one or the other because on the one hand, if you have, a, you have a very strong social contract, you will have very little homelessness, people coming out of institutions into housing. But then, you know, you might trade off on some uh, innovation or what is it that, you know, uh, is going on here that is kind of the freewheeling individualism. So it's not a simple answer at all to, to answer, but I think that we are way over in the, uh, very low taxes, don't trust government. We've been there since Ronald Reagan and that whole neoliberal approach. That's what created homelessness in the first place. We stopped building public housing. And even in the new conversations and the collaborations, there's not a lot of conversation about fixing the problem at its root, which is government building public housing. We used to build 350,000 units a year and now nothing, 50,000 max nationally, you know? So we're not going right, to. But can you imagine, though, like with this COVID money, this federal COVID money that's coming into the state, the American Rescue Plan, if housing was our priority, the governor would be calling up Maxwell and saying, Maxwell, how can I spend these billions of dollars? 
to yes. get the housing Georgia yes. needs. I bet Maxwell would have some answers for him, right? Absolutely. But that's not the call that's being made right now, to the best of my knowledge, right? No, because not right that's now. not where the energy is. There's broadband, right. there's all kinds of ideas being tossed around, but I haven't heard let's invest in public housing in Georgia with some of this money. Right. I, I think, uh, though, that some of the rescue plan the American Rescue Plan and the New Green Deal, you know, I think we can build better public housing than we had. Nobody wants to go back to building those big, chunky public housing buildings, but there's opportunities uh, in a, a more collaborative Green New Deal, public housing, employment for many, all of this infrastructure conversation we're having about housing as infrastructure as one of those, you know, uh, green housing as infrastructure. So there is an optimism certainly than we've had in the last four years about the possibilities of solutions, but it, it has to be in addition to priority, I think what the COVID uh, uh, pandemic has done is also remind us of the sense of urgency, urgency. You know, it's every day people are on the street suffering. That's like one day too many. And I think because we've had homelessness for 30 years, people who are 35 and under have grown up with homelessness. Some people think that this is sort of part of the urban landscape. There's, you know, outrage and urgency has to be brought back into that sense of we got to solve this now. Sam, you are uh, stealing the thunder for my next question, because uh, you know, something that Chris Johnson mentioned, what matters? I'd like for you all to take a few minutes, take a couple minutes, talk about the role of apathy. Is it public apathy? Is it government apathy in order to, you know, shift sort of the zeitgeist around the capital that's needed? Um, the, the apathy is a, an issue that um, I contemplate a lot. Um, and I come from a small government background before joining the state. Um, there are a lot of things that look like apathy that are um, more attributable to lack of information and lack of capacity. Um, and I've had to accept that um, where I would have liked to have charged people with a sense of apathy um, or an unwillingness to take action. Um, it, there, there is not a lot of extra capacity in our local government systems. Um, COVID has wildly overwhelmed all of them um, in ways that they absolutely were never prepared for. Nobody was prepared for this. Um, they prepare for all kinds of stuff, not this. Uh, there is a gap in opportunity for, you know, our agency to work better with local governments. Um, it's difficult in Georgia because you have the second most counties of any state after Texas. There's 159 counties. Um, that's a lot of different governments to work with. And there's over 500 cities. You know, there's there's money, and I, I say this as an encouragement. There's money on the table right now from FEMA. Um, they they opened up 100% reimbursement for emergency housing, but it's it's through local governments. Not many Georgia governments uh, at all have utilized any of those funds, um, and they could get 100% reimbursed. I know that many local governments are not prepared to pivot and request FEMA funds and administer the, like from being in one that was mid-size, had $90 million budget, that would have been a challenge. Most of them are much smaller in Georgia. Um, so that's a real um, frustration point, right? But there are opportunities for us to inform local governments of one, the success of, of evidence-based practices that there's not a general awareness of housing first, you know, like people in this work know about it. Absolutely. If you asked a average elected official, they won't know what that means. That's just reality. It's not a condemnation, right? Policymakers need to understand what programs are out there that they can even look to fund. Um, and then it's my job to make sure that a program that if I got a call from the governor's office, 
um, I know that that program is going to run smoothly, right? We have to modernize the programs that are out there because a lot of them have been left to dwindle and you can't scale them up, right? I, our program, we, we give way more vouchers than people who get housed because there's such a shortage of housing. Um, if you scaled up, if you doubled our program, one, we need to be prepared to scale. But if we doubled the number of vouchers that we were, it's not going to mean that that many more people get housed because there's still the same barrier. And, and that's really one of, you know, I, I can make, try to make this program run as efficiently and effectively as possible. But I have to also look bigger and look at, you know, how we can work with local governments because they're part of the puzzle too. And we have to work with them. They have unique access to funds sometimes. And I'll, the, my last note, I have actually, been, we have been a little surprised because some of the funds that are coming down to behavioral health agencies um, through SAMHSA, right? Uh, through mental health block grant funds, uh, they are telling us no on almost everything related to housing, e everything, all transitional housing, they're saying, no, you can't use this for roofs over people. Um, and they want us to work with DCA to use HUD, HUD funds. And we have partnership with DCA, right? But, but that is, I, I say that as a reality that there, there are also administrative barriers that we don't expect or don't think are gonna be there and people aren't always aware. Um, and that is frustrating, but it becomes a reality that we then have to try to navigate. Sam, I'd like for you to chime in. I see you nodding. Well, well, I'm just agreeing, uh, you know, uh, assenting. And I think Maxwell has done a great uh, job in explaining uh, apathy in terms of government and, you know, the challenges with that. And, and you know, one thing we have not said is the incredible, the, the, you know, homelessness, and I don't even think we should call it homelessness, extreme poverty, right? It's, we're talking about extreme poverty. It's all about the economics and this issue of even when the government is putting out money, we have a privatized housing market that the rents keep going further and further and they're uncontrolled and we'll never, we'll never be able to catch up unless we take on the really hard challenges of like, what are we gonna do about either creating new affordable housing, which is challenging or regulating housing so that we can have some of it, you know, owned by nonprofits or some other solution. That's what some of these countries outside of the United States are doing. Much of the rental housing is owned by nonprofits so that they're not looking to pay their stakeholders. They're reinvesting the profits in the housing and fixing it up. They're running like a quasi public housing entity. I wanna talk about apathy though, at the individual level, like how we are taught to look away from people who are homeless on the street. And we think that homelessness is somehow the problem of that individual. But I would, I would make the argument that every time and I, I, I've noticed this when, when you walk along the street with, with kids. Kids are kind of not, they've not been trained yet to, like they're taking in the world as it is. And there's a pain when they see someone who's homeless on the street, they'll look you know, like, mom, dad, what's going on? Why is this person here? They have that natural reaction of wanting to help. And they are trained by their parents. It's not polite, look, you know, we train people to look away from homelessness. And we look, that's the apathy. We train ourselves to look away from homelessness because we can't bear it. And what happens is we, it's not only the person who's suffering on the street, we are ourselves shutting ourselves down as humans. We are also paying a price. We are all paying a price for homelessness. The people, of course, most affected are the ones experiencing it. But we all of us have to shut something down, something fundamental to our humanity, which will cost us down the road. So we have to fix this. We have about two and a half minutes left. I'd like for each of you to take about 30 seconds, because I still have to close everything, 30 seconds, and give a shout out um, to an individual or a group you'd like to applaud. I'll start because I'm from out of town. I, 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 wanna, I wanna applaud the work of uh, the uh, Carter Center. Carter Center has been uh, 
instrumental in the um, uh, consciousness raising around mental health issues, has convened meetings around the Olmsted uh, lawsuit, uh, has acted as, a, as, as a, a place where difficult conversations take, can take place and solutions can be achieved. And I think the collaboration that we're seeing across the state of Georgia can point directly to the Carter Center as that initial table where people with very strong and differing opinions first began to meet to put together what's what's in place now. Chris? I will go with Mariel Sisley and the Georgia Supportive Housing Association who keep us motivated and engaged and connected on issues related to housing. Um, they have the Supported Housing um, conference, which is online this year in November. If you haven't attended before, it's a great place to get ideas about what's working around the state because there are lots of innovative things happening in Georgia, but learning about them, learning how to make them work in your own community is something a little different and something we don't always get an opportunity to do here. So I just shout out to Mariel. And Maxwell. Uh, certainly echo um, those two shout outs, uh, but given the opportunity, um, I would definitely want to recognize the, you know, the frontline providers that, that we uh, represent our provider network and especially uh, the PATH teams, which conduct, you know, outreach to individuals, meeting them where they are. Um, and there's 10 of those teams, five of them are in Atlanta. Um, they're doing incredibly difficult work, emotionally draining, physically draining um, every day of the week. And so I, I thank them and want to recognize them. And to all of our panelists, I would like to thank you. Um, as we close, I would like to leave you with another quote from The Alchemist. Again, I just finished reading this book. It's great. Quote, and that's where the power of love comes in, because when we love we always strive to become better than we are, unquote. And with that, thank you all for giving us the most valuable commodity there is out there, and that's time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Bakari, great job. Yeah, thank you, Bakari, Maxwell, Sam, and Chris. What a great panel, really, really great, and I really, Hope that participants as um, invited to before the panel will continue to put their questions and comments in regarding um, what the innovations are that are taking place around the uh, state and your local area. Uh, questions that you might have, comments, suggestions, as we'll be compiling this information and providing it. Um, on our website. So please look at the um, chat as well to see where you can find the um, document that we'll be putting together with answers. And thank you again, Mario, um, for your um, willingness to put these questions and answers together for us. Bakari, thanks again. Thank you, panelists. All right. So when preparing for this forum this year, we were told by many of you that an important part of the forum is the opportunity to um, reconnect with your colleagues. Uh, we would like to recreate that experience of grabbing a refreshment um, from Proof of the Pudding in the lobby of the chapel at the Carter Center and spending that time with your colleagues, friends, and fellow mental health advocates as best we can in this virtual space. One participant said when interviewed, what I like was lunch together and putting our feet up in the grass and connecting with each other. So we're gonna provide that opportunity to connect. Hang with us for the next 30 minutes, please, as we connect you with friends and colleagues. We will provide a break at 1230. So don't use this 30 minutes for your break, hang with us. This is how this will work. We will have two rounds of 10 minutes where we will connect you with your colleagues, participants of this program. The Zoom breakout room feature will take you into rooms randomly. You'll automatically be sent to a breakout room. So no need to take any action. Please don't take any action. We'll do this um, uh, without you needed to do anything. 
except that depending on your device, a small window may pop up asking you if you'd like to join that breakout room. So please select OK so that you can join your colleagues in some time to connect. Be prepared for a 60 second warning when you will need to wind up your conversation, okay? Now, I don't think that this group, having attended many Georgia Mental Health Forums, really need a prompt, um, but we're going to provide one just in case COVID's caused you to be just a little rusty in your conversations um, with colleagues. So the prompt is, what have you learned about yourself during the past year? So hold tight and our team behind the scenes will put us into a time where we can
Eve, you're on mute. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your time networking and reconnecting with folks. I want to remind everybody to turn on their uh, video and turn and unmute themselves. <laughs> we had some folks in our um, breakout that we couldn't hear or see, and that was disappointing. So the second prompt is, how has what you've learned about yourself in the past year influenced your perspective on mental health. And with that, I think we'll go. And then um, you'll have a 10 minute, oh, and then we'll go into our break.
Great, and welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed connecting. Now we will have a break for the next 15 minutes. Again, we'll be sharing photos and quotes and kudos from our community regarding Mrs. Carter's 50 years of work. See you promptly back at 12.45.
All right, it is 1247. Welcome back, everybody. Um, our next conversation is about how this past year has impacted children and the importance of serving all youth and their families after a traumatizing year. Without a doubt, supports are needed by all children and families in Georgia. Much of that support can be provided by implementing universal supports for all children in all schools. That is what we refer to as tier one prevention supports that benefit all children and their ability to live well and learn. This conversation will be facilitated by Michael Waller, executive director of the Georgia Appleseed, Georgia Appleseed Center for Law and Justice. Georgia Appleseed along with Georgia Voices for Children and the Carter Center are leading an initiative um, called Georgia School Base Initiative. Um, School, excuse me, school-based behavioral health initiative. In this initiative, we're looking to eliminate barriers to school-based behavioral health so that school-based behavioral health can become, become as common as the school lunch in Georgia. Again, please use the chat for questions and we will get to those questions as the conversation allows. At this time, I wanna turn it over to Michael. Thanks, Michael, and welcome. Thanks, Eve. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, it's always a real privilege to, to be here with the Carter Center and um, to be a part of the, the amazing work that you do. And Eve, it's, um, it's, been a, it's, it's really been important to me over the last few years uh, working this partnership with you and um, Voices for Georgia's Children um, that I get a chance to spend time with you and your staff. It's, uh, it's really remarkable the work you do and thank you. Um, I'm particularly excited though to facilitate this conversation because three of my favorite people uh, in this area are on the panel with me. Um, so Sue Smith, who's the Executive Director of the Georgia Parent Support Network is here with us. And there she is. Hi Sue. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you today. Also Layla Fitzgerald. She's Programmatic Officer with the Georgia Department of um, Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And then finally, Cheryl um, Galloway Benefield, who is uh, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Coordinator, which is a great title, um, the Office of Whole Child and Supports for the Georgia Department of Education. Cheryl has been in a number of different positions, actually, at the Department of Education, worked with the Georgia Appleseed uh, and from, and from various sort of perspectives on this issue. And so it's always great to be with you today. So what we're going to talk about is back to school. Um, 
And uh, we've been instructed that we're not supposed to tell lots of stories, which um, so many of us get into this work because of the stories. But we've been told that we really need to try to focus on concrete solutions because we've only got an hour. Um, and that's great because there are a lot of concrete solutions. There's a lot of, as we've heard over the last couple of days, evidence-based approaches that do matter, that do change things. And we're gonna talk about some of those today. And we're each got kind of a little area. We, we, we got together before, talked a little bit so that we could facilitate, make this conversation um, sort of smooth, but we wanna make sure that we hear from y'all as well. So um, please ask your questions and uh, we'll try to get to those to start with. I wanna, I wanna go around a little bit um, and, uh, and kind of we can talk a little bit about the things that are most important to us, but I want to I want to set set the scene just a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of statistics because uh, folks have heard a lot of those uh, over the last couple of days. But but just to center this a little bit, and I want to reach into um, some of the work that our partner George uh, Voices for Georgia's Children has done. They did a recently did a did a wonderful report on uh, school based behavioral health services, um, and there's some there's some information there that that I'll I'll reference here as well as some of our own research that just kind of sets the stage. So ju just a couple minutes of that. Um, and, and these are these are the stats that we, we sort of all know, you know, two to, uh, you know, one in six kids from the ages of two to eight, um, right, have a diagnosed mental health or developmental disability or behavioral health disorder. That's a huge number. And that's, and since we're talking about universal prevention uh, um, here uh, and, and screening goes along with that, those are the diagnosed kids. So we know there are more kids than that. Uh, we also know that, that when kids have those um, diagnoses or have um, struggles with mental health, um, developmental disabilities that aren't well uh, supported um, and behavioral health challenges, those have profound impacts for their schooling. Um, and actually uh, the, what we're gonna talk about today is their schooling has profound impact on those conditions as well. So how they do later on in life. Um, in Georgia, if you're a child and you have a disability, um, your, likely, your likelihood of being punished and expelled from school doubles or triples, depending on who you talk to. And a lot of those disabilities are learning disabilities, developmental disabilities, uh, mental health disabilities. And so those kids just aren't being served because if they don't get the services that they need, um, and only one in six kids in Georgia have or uh, two, or, yeah, one in six kids in Georgia, I think that's the right statistic, but something like that, really are able to access the services they need, um, then you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be able to perform at school and you're not, you're not gonna succeed. So what we wanna talk about here today are some various um, strategies and concrete approaches that you can take um, in communities uh, and in partnership with nonprofits, with your local school, uh, with the government, um, and other, uh, other providers um, and private providers uh, to support children when they need it. So Georgia Appleseed is a law center. Uh, so I am the person who is, um, has the least expertise on this panel about this subject. Uh, so what we do is we focus on legal and policy reforms primarily um, to support children. And our angle is uh, keeping kids in school, supported, succeeding in school and out of the juvenile justice system. And so we came at this work from that perspective. How do we help kids stay in class and out of the juvenile justice system? And so we focus on those kids who have historically been the ones who are most likely to um, face barriers like excessive student discipline, suspensions, expulsions, and risk of juvenile justice system involvement. And those are kids who are um, confronting barriers like racism and structural racism and systemic racism, um, uh, discrimination against their identity status as LGBTQ plus kids, uh, kids who have disabilities and aren't getting the services they need or are being discriminated against, children in poverty and children in foster care. And one of the strategies that we discovered was most effective uh, in helping schools support these kids uh, was school climate reform. And for us, school climate reform is an opportunity to look at the adults in the room. So while education is often focused on the child and interventions are focused on the particular child, we felt was very important is school climate reform, like positive behavioral interventions and supports, which is, uh, which is actually uh, mentioned in the unified vision um, document that we've spent some time discussing over the last couple of days, that those, those approaches focus on the grownups and they focus on the community they create in the school. And in 2010, we started working on this 
uh, did some research, interviewed some folks you know, across the state, uh, talked to some experts, and began to develop policy solutions in partnership with Department of Education. And uh, Cheryl, in fact, has been part of that conversation for a long time on the phone here. So for us, looking at school climate, looking at the services that a school can provide, and looking at the policies that support the provision of those services is a real priority. So I just want to do that to set the stage a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about strategies that we think um, Georgia Appleseed, that Georgia Parent Support Network, that DBHDD, and Layla in her individual capacity, I'm sure, um, and, uh, and Cheryl and the Department of Education and Cheryl in her independent uh, individual capacity think are really important and that the, that the state should, um, should in Georgia should adopt. Uh, I want to go over just a, a few right now. Um, so one is a focus on equity. And, and equity, of course, means focusing on the individual child, the individual child's needs. But the solutions often come from the community. So again, looking at the classroom, looking at the teacher, looking at the structure of the school, where it's placed, what kind of services it provides, what it's called, whether or not it creates a safe place for a child to learn, for a child to feel like they can fail in their attempt at learning, and that's okay, they're gonna be okay, where it feels like their identity is affirmed. Um, look whether or not there are and then applying evidence-based approaches to actually doing all of those things. So looking at positive behavior interventions and supports and other school climate reform models and social emotional learning supports. Engaging with the community, and that includes parents. So real focus on parents. And Sue's gonna talk about particular approaches that are very successful, uh, but looking at the community. So the, the parents are part of the community, but so is the local, um, the local courts which play a big role in how police interact with schools, looking at the school police and what kind of partnerships can schools, juvenile courts, police, and other community members have to, to, re, to change the way that schools approach their supports to kids, how they approach school discipline in particular. Developing culturally responsive programming that again is equity focused, focused on identities, making sure that the kids are, feel supported and feel safe and have someone they feel they can look up to and they can talk with. Clear expectations. Uh, and the expectations that are developmentally appropriate for the child, right? So looking at what are you expecting the child to do? What kind of stresses do those create? Do they understand what they're, what's expected of them and other changes that you can make there? Um, providing supports like school-based behavioral health, making sure that kids get behavioral health when they need it, where they need it, and how that can be done. So for Georgia Appleseed in partnership with the Carter Center, for example, and Voices for Georgia's Children, looking at like, you know, how's that funded? Uh, how can that work for folks? What's a successful model and what isn't? So that, that's a bit of a framework that we use when we're thinking about this problem. And Georgia Appleseed works in collaboration with communities, with individuals, um, with uh, our legal community in particular, and with state policymakers to see how we can move all of those issues forward. So that's a little bit about um, Georgia Appleseed and a way to shoehorn in a little bit of background about some of these other areas. I, I want to open this up, though, and ask for um, the panel's responses to some of that, and also just to, to highlight where, where you think are some of the most important areas, the most important interventions uh, that we should be thinking about. So why don't we start with, well, let's put it this way. So I've kind of sketched out a broad approach, school climate kind of is the foundation. So why don't we start with the school? And Cheryl, why don't I hand it off to you? And you could talk a little bit about what you think is the most important and also how the Department of Education is approaching supporting some of those efforts. Well, hey, and thank you all for having me. It's so good to be here with you today. Um, so much of what you said resonated, Michael, and it, wow, it really resonated. I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think when you said equity, that struck such a chord with me and, and with the work that we do in the Office of Whole Child Supports. Um, you know, Without a doubt, we have to do things that are, you know, whole child responsive and look at how the school responds. But we know that our students don't come to school with an equitable background or not all backgrounds look the same. And we know that all schools are not built on the same kind of ground. So what your universal supports look like and what your school climate looks like when you start building that, you have to consider the elements that are in place on the ground. 
and how you start building that foundation of school climate, are you sure that children have access to mental health services, to physical health services, um, oral health? Or are we meeting and addressing those health barriers to learning that are also health barriers to healthy development? So while we're building that foundation, what are we doing to make sure that foundation is being built on ground that is as level as we can possibly make it? That's great. And I, I want to come back to that in a second, because you talked specifically about what it looks like on the ground. And, and we should probably talk about what does that, what, what do those things look like when they're on the ground? Because we often talk about services at kind of a high level, but I think today folks might want to hear about what those kind of look like. Uh, but, but first, Layla, so from your perspective, I mean, you're coming at this as a totally different government agency, but one that's specialized um, in, in a way that the Department of Education um, is not. I mean, traditionally education has been about educating the child, but as Cheryl pointed out, this is about, and I, this is really, I wanna lift this up, Cheryl. It's, it's addressing the barriers, not just to learning, but to development because right. the job is both. So can you, can you talk about that a little bit, Layla? So it's, I mean, Cheryl and I go back and forth all the time. We actually sit on the same team at DOE for the whole child support team. But it's really normalizing that conversation. It's having conversations with each other about what's really going on with their child, whether it's mental health, physical health, or whatever that may be, but really getting into what's really going on with that child, like really diving in and assessing the child and placing them with the proper services that can help benefit that child and that family, whether that's mental health services, whether that's IDD services, whether that's getting them a pediatrician or connecting them uh, to a dentist, whatever that barrier to learning may be to be able to have them in the classroom um, for as long as they should be in the classroom. We know that children are coming with overwhelming situations to us. And a lot of times we jump right to mental health illness. And a lot of times it's not a mental health illness. It's really normalizing the conversation around their feelings. It's equipping those around them and training those around them who interact with children on a daily basis to sort of be able to assess the signs and symptoms of what are and what aren't mental health illnesses, to be able to encourage our young people to really speak out um, about their feelings fearlessly and be able to connect them to the right resources. We have so many great programs across the state of Georgia. Apex, of course, is my baby. Um, so I, of course, I'm gonna push school-based mental health services, but there's so many other great things out there. We have uh, Sources of Strength is a great program. We have so many um, programs that not only deal with signals is another great training that can go on for our younger children. You have Youth Mental Health First Aid, but there's so many different avenues that you can come at this beast so that I, I sort of call it, but we can't look at one lens um, camera. We have to have sort of a wide lens. You said it um, best. Community is the best way. Um, with community, you not only have to communicate, but you have to coordinate. So making sure that all the state agencies are talking to each other, all the nonprofits know what's going on, and making sure, like Cheryl said, that we are not having a cookie cut cut approach. Like we are really tailoring this to South Georgia. We are really tailoring this to the children who live in the mountains because we've learned through the APEX program, you cannot provide one, one type of service for everybody in the state of Georgia. You've got to tailor that to the community that you're working in. So for me, it's like Cheryl said, building that foundation, having those universal and tier two prevention and early intervention um, services in place so that we don't run box the tier one um, services. We don't, tier three services. We don't want a lot of children going up to tier three services. We want to be able to keep them in tier one and tier two so that we can be able to have them regularly engage in school um, atmosphere or after school atmosphere or home atmosphere. We want to make sure we're keeping them in that main place and making sure that they're healthy all around. It's a holistic approach and it's going to take the whole community to make that holistic approach for the children, especially coming out of COVID. So why don't we talk about, before we get, uh, well, Sue, jump in for this, but I, but I want to talk to Sue specifically about community engagement and, and parent engagement. But before we do that, maybe um, some background for folks. So um, Layla, you talked about tier one, tier two, and tier three services. And um, that language is that we, we all swim in that language um, here. And, and it's really important to understand um, what those tiers are. 
Uh, so can you, can you kind of lay out from your perspective? And what's interesting about this, I'm going to ask Cheryl, you to do the same thing afterwards, because there are some differences in the approach from the educator's perspective um, and from the behavioral health professional's perspective. So Layla, could you, could you start with that? So for us, tier one is universal prevention. All children, all parents, all teachers, everyone involved should be getting some type of prevention um, engagement with their with everyone. So universal prevention is tier one and all children should get tier one. Tier two is that early intervention. Um, and you're not going to have the same percentage that's early intervention because you're you're figuring out what services they need during that time. And for us, that's either group therapy or individual therapy. If it's individual therapy, they roll up to tier three, which is all in all um, intensive treatment for children. So for us, it's providing that universal prevention at tier one, tier two is early intervention, and tier three is intensive intervention from coming from the mental health. Thank you, Layla. So Cheryl, from, and if you can, from the sort of the teacher's perspective, Mm -hmm. um, because this triangle, and it forms a triangle for folks, so, so you, we don't have a triangle, but you can imagine a triangle across the bottom is tier one. That's a lot of kids um, or every child. And then the middle tier are fewer children. So from Layla's perspective, that's group therapy and those kind of sessions. And then mm -hmm. tier one, those are intensive interventions with individual children. So from the school's perspective, can you talk about um, how that, that triangle and, and sort of how it interlays with uh, interfaces with uh, PBIS, for example, for school climate reform efforts? So when you talk to schools about pyramids of intervention, you just opened a whole box of pyramids. Um, it's like Egypt over here. We've got all the pyramids in education. So academic interventions, behavior interventions, whole child, everything is on a pyramid. And we look at that as whatever is at tier one, um, that should be supporting all children. And the, and the hope is that with those universal approaches that we're going to um, make most children best able to um, function well and experience their education fully. So from a um, whole child slash school's climate perspective, there you're talking about things that are gonna support the well-being and the mental health of students. So we're talking about things that are going to build the mental health of students and support mental wellness. So that's what we're doing at tier one. At tier two, you're gonna move into things for students who are still struggling or who may bubble up out of tier one, that even with tier one interventions or whole school uh, programs and projects in place, you've got students that are gonna need a little bit more. And whether that is related to a behavior that's manifesting in the classroom, whether it's peer interaction, whatever they may be um, struggling with, at tier two, that's where you're gonna look more at the needs of the kids at that at that level. So in tier two, you might have small groups. So if you have a number of students who are, and we will have this when we come back in the fall, they're going to be students, a group of students who have experienced loss during the pandemic. So that group of students might need a, a support group or just a group to come together to discuss what's happening in their lives and to help them, you know, better uh, assimilate or fit in to being back in a school setting, because particularly for those students who've just been out of the building for, um, gosh, by that point, over a year and a half, right? So then at tier three, that's where we're looking at the kids who will need individual and specialized supports and services. That may be mental health, that may be a referral for a special ed evaluation. It can look like a number of things in education, but basically it's the same as Layla described. We have the universal supports at tier one. We've got the um, more group or individualized at tier two, but really top, the tier three is the specialized services and supports. And that is, again, like Layla said, your pyramid should go up. It shouldn't go like this. So most students should be responding to tier one and tier two. And if they're not, you need to revisit your tier one and tier two and figure out how you need to adjust there. And the impact is also, can also have that sort of triangle effect in the sense that when we look at school discipline um, and how yes. many children are being expelled or suspended, for example, when you have an effective school climate reform effort, when you have, when you, have uh, you know, a comprehensive kind of approach to looking at child child's needs, 
-hmm. and teaching things like social emotional learning, looking at a school and whether or not it's, it's clearly articulating what its expectations are, you can eliminate a lot of discipline problems, which then just allows you to focus resources on those upper tiers to really help those kids who need it. Um, so I also want to everyone keep keep an eye on the chat. There's some wonderful yeah. questions coming in. Um, Helen and Eve, thank you for addressing some of those. We'll come back because Layla, we're going to need to talk about Apex a little bit and explain what that is. Um, but first, Sue, so we, we've talked about the school uh, and how the school and how DBHDD in the schools kind of think about issues. Um, what about when we expand out to the community and to parents? What are what are some of the ways? First, of all, let me start out. Why should we inv involve parents at all? I mean, this is right, the fundamental question for you. Um, what, first of all, why should we involve parents? Why should we involve the community? And what are some effective ways to do that? Sue, so you're on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Layla and Cheryl, for clearly laying out the levels of care and uh, from a parent perspective, they can be kind of daunting. Uh, first, I wanted to say, most people know about Danny who brought me to this life a long time ago. And Danny once came home and I was trying to, she was in real pretty bad shape, she was in school and I was trying to figure out what might help. And I said, well, who do you talk to? And she thought about it a minute. She said, the man that cleans the floors, the man that brings the food and the ladies that serve the food. And um, and then I asked what she talked about, et cetera, and went into that. Because I'm afraid when we build our communities, and that was one of the things that you were talking about, how do we build a community with the parents? We leave out the people who aren't the people behind the desk or aren't the people that are making decisions or even necessarily in the classroom. She might have balked or been scared of or afraid of what was going to happen to her talking to those people. So I think, number one, back then there was little focus on the kids or the parents in the school. And we were often banned from being in the classroom, which is not the case today. So I wrote down some stuff about community. Georgia has gone far above and beyond anywhere I've heard of today in trying the AIM project in South Georgia, Apex and other programs that are truly involving people at all levels of the communities and numbers I've not seen before. So that's an amazing thing that's happening. And to answer, why should we involve parents? Because if I don't trust you, little that you say or do is going to make me do anything with my child. I need to trust you. I need to know that we're partners. I need to know that there's not a meeting before and after the meeting that I'm actually asked to come. I don't need to read supports. And I have done this in my lifetime that say how dysfunctional I am with all my effort to keep my kid in your school. And I don't think, what I don't think is, and it's not, it's a huge elephant. And we're all on different sides of the elephant and we all have to come together. Parents have to be honored for the skills and the expertise and where they are in their life and their situation, or we're not gonna be able to help. Um, we have to meet people where they are, not on the piece of paper that we think they should be on. Um, you know, and, and Georgia is, as I think maybe Cheryl said, incredibly, maybe it was Layla, incredibly different from the North Georgia mountains to the S South Georgia flats. The same thing does not, not even the same language works. We could be different little islands almost. Um, you, you, you have to, you know, my vision is that our community services would be tailored to the people and the regions and their acceptance of the services we're building and have to offer that they would be very regionally, um, regionally focused. So I wrote down some stuff. I think it needs to be individualized. And this is like, I guess, the original idea of the individual education plan. Now for Danny, they used to print that out and tell me, ask me if I could sign it with a blindfold on. I'm kidding, but it was almost that bad. And so um, we, I, I really want it to be individualized. I want us, if, if it's done the best it can be done, we got to ask questions that the school can't really feel in order to know what the real need is. If I come to school and the only meal I get every day is either the lunch or breakfast or whatever at school, then you got to know by the time I get there for the next breakfast, I'm in pretty bad shape. If I come home and I don't wash and I'm dirty, you, this takes a different kind of thinking than we have thought before in Georgia about our children, basically. 
you know, maybe when I was in the first grade, now that's really a long time ago, but maybe when I was in the first grade, they had those kind of services in our school. The nurses were there, the doctors were there, all that stuff. Uh, well, there weren't any doctors, but that's stretching it. Nurses were there. Uh, so I applaud Georgia, DBHDD, all the partners, the Carter Center. Uh, a lot of things have to happen. A really lot of things have to happen. And you're on, you're on the path. You're engaging everybody at every level. It's never been done before. Pretty sure of that. Um, and at some point, we're going to talk about parity. Maybe we're not there yet. But Tom had dropped in the chat, and I can't see well enough to read most of it, but I read Tom's. And this is something that's kind of new to our focus. But I think that we haven't honored or thought about our geared stuff to deal with the trauma our children experience. Thank you. Well, Sue, why don't we, uh, I, we, do, we do need to touch on trauma um, because it is a really important part of the conversation and it, and it is growing. I mean, the, the amount of trauma-informed approaches um, in the juvenile courts, among attorneys representing children in the schools, um, training for, for staff across the state um, in all different areas. But, but before we do that, let's, let's continue to talk about the community and the parents a little bit and just get real concrete. So Sue, can you talk about you know, peer supports or other um, other efforts you think really work and really do get parents involved and support them and through that support the child? Absolutely. <clears throat> it's been growing and DBHDD, I think, has been the leader for years in trying to involve parents in many different ways. Um, long before there was ever CPS or CPSYs in Georgia, Georgia had peer support. And can you describe what... Sue, can you describe what those are? Um, you use some acronyms there just for folks who aren't familiar. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it's too easy, isn't it, everybody? Uh, certified peer specialist parents and certified peer specialist you. And Tom, I, um, Tom um, I will share with you that I the first meeting I ever went to, I came home and told my husband I would never go back. I didn't know one sentence. It was all filled with these words I didn't understand. So, yes, it's we need to be careful about that. Um, Certified peer specialist parents are people who have lived experience parenting a child who fits the criteria set out by the state. And the criteria changes a little bit from time to time, but it's basically the youth we wouldn't be needing to take care of. And the words to describe it change over time. It was severely emotionally disturbed. It's, you know, all the all of the kids who end up and everybody's on everybody's list that needs services. So it's a different group of kids. And incidentally, for everybody in the audience, when you change agencies, the language changes. So you don't necessarily the you don't necessarily have one term that goes across all the agencies. So that's kind of important, Michael, because people don't fit all the stuff together. Um, so certified peer specialists complete a curriculum which we now are transitioning into with the help of Dana, everybody knows Dana and Layla and the department uh, to being the providers of the training. We tra did our first training two weeks ago. And um, it, they've been doing this for approximately four years, training parents and about four or five maybe parents and, and a few less training certified peer youth. These are people certified in a curriculum that the state helps develop. And uh, we are now the trainers that state trained prior to this. And we will have a workforce, hopefully growing very fast, of certified parents and youth statewide that can be everywhere they're needed to support uh, families. And in a way, I think, um, I, I, I tried, you know, Danny asked me the other day, what do you think it'd been like if we had somebody like that? Uh, heaven on earth, maybe, you know, something really really tremendous to, you know, I know the first person I talked to that knew had ever heard of a, a child like Danny was just the biggest relief in the world. So I think that we're looking at a whole new level of service. It's going to be very popular. We hope so. Uh, I, somebody to navigate the schools. We used to do that when we knew nothing about doing it. We just looked like we did and tried to look like we did. So these people could be Technically, it's not what's happening right now. You could have, or it happens to a certain extent, you could have a parent or youth who was trained in a school specialty. It might be different from being in a hospital specialty, you know, different places you might be employed. You could have additional education for those. The curriculum we have now 
uh, teaches how to tell your story and support other people. Empathy, um, hope. I think that was one of the big things that I got out of the training was hope. So it's I'm not being too specific, but I think it's going to be the future of a lot of um, on which a lot of what we're doing is based. Well, Sue, I very much appreciate that you you started this by talking about again the other the other adults in the space that are also interacting with the child or the youth and how important they are. Um, and the parents are one of those. And so by supporting and focusing attention on and providing resources and training to those folks, we support the child. Can you tell us, so with a peer, a uh, certified peer uh, special or uh, support who is a parent, a parent um, peer, what does that look like exactly? Are they, they teamed up with parents? Are they available on the phone just to answer questions? I mean, what, what exactly is that relationship and how will it work? It actually works different depending on who hires them. Um, it, like we have a program that has uh, people in the uh, parents, CPSPs, parents, in the CHOA emergency room and what they might be asked to do or provide information on in the setting of their work might be very different than someone who works for Community Service Board in South Georgia or, you know, who's hired as, uh, um, by anyone else. And every employer is going to want to use the position differently, and they currently do. Uh, could be in an emergency waiting room somewhere, could be in a, an office, could be in a school. There are some in schools now. Um, what we're finding, an unintentional be benefit is, they're also at LIPT meetings because they now have the education to be there. Uh, they're now serving on boards in their community. The voice is growing. They're becoming leaders in their PTAs. They're talking in their schools about mental health. So the unintended consequence of the certified peer and youth movement is that we're having a really much stronger parent voice and coming youth voice. Thank you, Layla. She's heavy into the youth voice um, in the state. So that's the unintended consequence, I think, is maybe even the most important one. Uh, but as far as the work goes, your job description comes from your employer. And the, and the employee, which is the CPS, P or Y, come with a set of skills that are taught and, and supported by the curriculum. And then, th then those certified peer specialists, they support the parents um, who have come, come via whoever this, whatever this provider is, whether it's an emergency room or a school or some other provider, then they're, they're provided via that service provider. Is that the Yes, okay. they, they support the parents. In the training, there's even a little training on what if the parent doesn't agree with the team or the professionals or the doctor or whomever and how to handle situations like that when you might agree with the other team, but you are the supporter of the parent. And, you know, to honor and, and kind of keep untouched the parent voice to be able to do that. And I believe that'd be a huge skill. So, uh, you know, it's not an easy job. But yes, they are there to support the parent and then the parents, the family. And, and um, I think kind of like a translator between the two, the parent and the, uh, and, and the team, if, they, if that needs to be. Well, let's, can, we, can we build on that? So um, Cheryl, can you talk a little bit about the role of the school's relationship with the parent in supporting a child's behavioral health, mental health, developmental you know, supports for de developmental disabilities, those sorts of things? How, how does... How should, what are some ways that, that, that work where the school can engage and, and work with parents to support the children? So uh, let me start by saying that way back in the day, I came to know Sue and Dana and everybody at the state uh, because of my son who is uh, significantly emotional and behavior disordered, um, mental health diagnoses. And um, I was a parent mentor for a school district and working with students with an IEP with those families and was asked to join the Chipper Project. So we, I worked on the team that wrote the curriculum for the CPS parents. And my son actually worked on the team that wrote the CPS youth curriculum. So um, this is, Sue, so, oh my gosh, this is so dear to my heart. And in my dream world, every school would have a CPS parent every school. Um, that's Cheryl's dream world. But um, 
that's always my lens when in the work that I do, how are we supporting families? How are we honoring families and community in this work um, and not sitting in an education silo? So at the, um, in schools in general, um, there are family liaisons who are there at the schools. A number of districts do have parent mentors who are the parents of students with an IEP. And I was the first parent of a student with an IEP for um, uh, an emotional and behavior disorder. But now there are a number of them who that is their experience. That's you know what they do. And we do a lot of training with our parent mentors. And when they're in a school district, they're there not just to support the families of students with IEPs, but all families. So um, the, the way that schools approach parent engagement and family involvement and things of that nature, there are some very structured and required pieces. But as with anything, as with our students, everything comes down to relationships. So we see um, the family engagement piece and we see parent support strongest in those schools and in those districts where there are really good relationships being built. And, you know, that goes, Michael, directly to school climate and it goes directly to whole child supports. It goes to everything. The more you build those relationships, the stronger everything is gonna to be to support that child. That's how we truly wrap around children is when those relationships are built and they are grounded and founded in honest communication and, and, and building a caring relationship between everybody at the table. Cheryl, if I could say our, our vision differs only in that, I think at least two in every school. Oh gosh, yes, Sue, and a youth. Can we put a youth too? <laughs> of course. There we go. I, I see a really natural connection between what you're talking about, Cheryl, and then the, then the school actually in the state responding um, by saying, hey, we've got this relationship with the parents. What, what, are, the, what are the parents telling us? And, if, and the parents might be saying, hey, I'd like to get more services for my kids. But um, that's hard to do because I live in an area where it's very a long yeah. way to travel to a provider. So, Layla, I want to transition to Apex for just a second. Um, but first, I want to point out in the chat, um, thanks, folks have been posting in some resources. So there's the, a link to the DBHDD provider manual there for behavioral health. That'll answer a lot of questions. Uh, Eve, thank you for posting. Uh, Georgia Appleseed has some help guides. And so as we talk about... Uh, as acronyms fly around or you hear um, uh, topics mentioned, you want to find a little bit more at a really accessible level, our help guides um, address a lot of these issues at a high, very accessible level where you can get an introduction to, introduction to those topics um, and, and be pointed to some additional resources, um, including APEX uh, and the provision of student-based, school-based behavioral health services. So Layla, can you talk about um, APEX just very, very briefly sort of what it is, but I think more important for the folks on the call is how, how can school-based behavioral health integrate into a school? And so thinking of it as not just the, the tier three, a child needs to talk to a counselor, but those tier one and tier two and, and parent um, outreach, how does school-based behavioral health support that? Of course, I would not find my cursor to get off mute, but thanks, Michael. Um, as you see, this is like a direct link to everyone. Um, Sue has talked about the parents and Cheryl has talked about the schools and the school climate. And DBHCD is doing that with the Georgia APEX program. So the Georgia APEX program is a school-based mental health program that provides services directly to students within the school building. Um, we partner with community service boards and tier two mental health providers that have been vetted through the DBHD system um, to provide these services, to embed clinicians in the schools to provide services, whether it's individual group or helping teachers to um, coordinate their classrooms, providing youth mental health first aid training. So some of that tier one um, universal prevention gets provided through those these services as well. Um, holding group, group, group meetings and group settings uh, for children to discuss depression and anxiety, um, the race uh, inequities that have been going on, um, whatever issue that may be rising to the top that becomes um, so overwhelming for others, or so many have spoke on it, they provide group um, therapy to that. But it's three goals for the Georgia APEX program. It's to increase access, it's for early detection, and it's to strengthen coordination. And through that, we have 
um, 31 providers who have provided services in over 630 schools. Um, now going into our sixth year of the program. Uh, we provided over 20,000 referrals, over 290,000 services have been provided in the schools. Um, our first year we were in 155 schools. Now we're in over 630. That's a 306 percentage growth over a six year period. Um, and the program works. Um, children have, uh, when you embed a clinician into the school environment and they become part of the school family and they know that the teachers and the social worker and the school counselor and the principal and the administrator are all on board with this program because that's what it takes for a great program to happen. Um, a successful program in the apex um, sort of toolage. Um, once you have all of those buy-in members into this program and you have individuals assessing them properly so that you're connecting them with the right resources or the right programs or the right supports, um, you have a very, very, very productive program. And that's us, the Georgia Apex program. Um, if we could embed clinicians in every school, we would. If we had the funding to be able to provide services to every student in the state of Georgia, of course we would. But we have a workforce shortage. Um, Apex is a drop in the bucket, but it takes a village to raise the children. It's going to take a village to support them coming back into the schools. Um, so Georgia Apex is here. Um, we uh, actually have a procedure where a process to how you become an Apex school. Um, the school, we, we allow the mental health providers to connect with the school officials to determine which schools that they go into. We are not in that. We are just there to support them in providing funding. We don't have a lot of funding anymore, um, but we provided funding to those mental health providers to provide those services in the schools. Uh, we did get um, uh, a set of funding from Governor Dill, um, now Governor Kemp, um, and we are utilizing that funding through those community service boards and mental health providers to provide those services. So um, as Georgia Apex is a wonderful program and we would love to have those school-based mental health services in every school, it does take more than us to be able to provide services for um, individuals as well as teachers and parents because we forget, um, just like Sue said, your, your cafeteria worker and your janitorial worker in the school knows everything about every child in that school, but we fail to be able to train and educate them to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms. The cafeteria worker always knew who I was because I always asked for an extra biscuit or an extra sausage. It never mattered. When that child stops asking for that extra biscuit or extra sausage, that cafeteria worker reaches out and says, hey, something's wrong with Johnny. The janitorial worker knows that they're hanging out in the hallways talking about certain things because they don't, they think the janitorial worker is not there. So they talk about everything when they're walking past them. And those two individuals have been in the school systems the longest, but we don't empower them to be able to train them. We don't empower the um, front desk worker to be able to help support all those individuals. And then we don't talk to each other within the school. So we have a lot of places where we're not talking to each other. If we can come out of our silos and come out of talking about who has the money and really run the programs that are there to support the children, our children will be in a better place on a universal prevention set. We won't have as many people rolling up to tier two, and we won't have as many individuals rolling up to tier three, whether that's physical health services or mental health services on any set. Providing that universal prevention, providing opportunities for individuals to learn and educate and train each other and to be able to empower those individuals who we leave out of the village, but are so, so crucial and beneficial. Our, our bus drivers, they pick up and transport our children every day, empower those individuals to be able to recognize signs and symptoms. Um, and here we are on the Georgia Apex, we're here if we need us, it's like insurance. You know, you got to keep paying for it just in case, but we don't want to have to use insurance if we don't need it. We want to be able to empower every individual in that school, whether it's a parent, because they too have power in the school, whether it's administrative, whether it's a school, whether it's a teacher, we've got to be able to empower each other. Thank you, Layla. And, you know, that reminds me, I had a, interviewed a school resource officer once who, who had this story that she liked to tell about interacting with a school-based counselor. Um, so a mental health counselor at the school. And there was a child who was running away from campus. And the traditional approach was to punish the child from running away from campus. Um, and so she, it was her job to kind of catch this kid and bring him back. Um, and she, this was an ongoing process. And she finally sat down in the mental health counselor and said, what do I do? I've talked to everyone else. I don't know how to make this stop happening. She wanted to do her job better. And they had a conversation about 
the approach. Um, and so the school resource officer referred the child to this um, mental health professional, discovered why the child was running away from school, um, uh, you know, dealt with that issue. And then when the issue came up with another child, she had a different approach. She had a tool. She could talk to someone um, and approach it that way. So um, we, we're running just out of time. Just to piggyback, Michael, yeah. I know we're running out of time. We were just, Department of Ed Education, DOE, we were all just in an amazing training with Gypstick, Georgia's, oh God, police. Georgia Public Safety Training Center. I'm still here. Help me, help me out. Help me out, yep. sir. We've been um, here Talking all about empowering yep. SROs to do just that, talking about what training they need, yep. utilizing them to be able to help assess and, and be able to know which support they need, but really knowing most of our SROs know their children, know their families, know their environment. Uh, we had some great people from Habersham County. Habersham. Uh, great work. Uh, so there's some models out there, Michael, that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's some great models that are happening across the state of Georgia that if we can all adapt to and get to that universal language, that we're all speaking the same thing. As my mom used to say, we're all drinking the same Kool-Aid and it's called red. It's not called cherry or strawberry. So making sure we are all on the same page and talking the same language and talking to each other. So SROs definitely. And, and, you know and also to the question about trauma training for SROs, um, that is built into the training that we've been seeing this week. They're talking about trauma. They're talking about ACEs. And we are really partnering closely with Gypstick and other groups around this SRO training to make sure that they're looking at the whole child and all of these things that are impacting students. So it's um, it's been a great week. And I'm going to hand it back to you, Michael, but just want to throw that in there and acknowledge the question that came up that yes, that is something that's on the radar and we are working on. And, and it's really important. I, you know, quickly in SROs, um, school resource officers uh, and the, po the policing in schools is, a, is a, something of great concern to Georgia Appleseed and to a lot of Georgians. There's the potential for criminalization of children, um, obviously. And, um, and this is another reason to talk about the importance of community collaborations and supporting children in school because um, there are approaches to community collaboration, school justice, um, committees, for example, um, and the school justice partnerships that bring police and juvenile courts and the schools and other stakeholders together to talk about training for school resource officers, but also what their roles should be and the relationship between policing and providing services and discipline in schools and separating out um, policing from discipline. And that can be a, that's a major, um, you know, part of school climate for kids, uh, making sure that policing is, is not something that's mixed in with discipline because um, that creates additional risks for children. We've got, we, we're running out of time. It's a wonderful conversation. Um, I, wanna, I wanna open it up, it's okay with you guys for some questions from folks. Um, and I also wanna reserve a little time at the end because we wanna take a few minutes and go around each of us um, and um, say, you know, what, what, are the, what are some calls to action? What can people do? And so we'll reserve a little bit of time, but why don't we take the next few minutes, if it's okay with y'all, and, uh, and field some questions. So um, Eve, how best do we wanna do that? We just open it up and people ask questions. Do we wanna moderate people raise hands? What's the best approach? I think the questions, let's take the questions that have been put in the chat, Michael. Great. I'm scrolling through. I think we already addressed the our school resource officers being trained. Um, so if people have questions, if you just pop it in the chat and then I can help Michael with those as he tries to moderate and read the chat. <laughs> so here's your chance, everybody. Um, yeah. Drop a question in the chat. We'll give folks um, a couple minutes to do that. While they're doing that, why don't we just go around and, and quickly what is the, if you could have anything right now, and, and I, let's look at it from the individual school level. If you could have anything changed at the school level, at the classroom level, um, what, would, what, would that, what would that one thing be? And you can stay, I know there's lots of things we could do. So you can stay within your area of focus, so it's fair. Um, and so what I would say is, I would say that no child, no child was suspended or expelled without the provision of multi-tiered system, a multi-tiered system of supports. In other words, that child is 
is um, the, the school talks to that child, finds out what their needs are, what's causing those discipline issues, and then tries to address those needs. Um, and then I would say, then, then no kid gets kicked out of their community, right? No kid gets exiled effectively from their community. They're all, they're all feeling supported. So that, that's the one that I'll say. Uh, why don't we go, Sue, why don't you go next? Suffering from Layla's disability or finding the, the, um, what, what would I want most? Um, I, I don't really agree with, you know, um, expelling children, period. So that's kind of out for me. You know, I was one of those that didn't get just, I was thrown out of school long before anybody ever got thrown out of school. So it's kind of a hard subject for me to talk about. So, um, I guess what I would want more than anything would be trust. I, I don't know how you build it. And I don't think it's one thing, but I've been in schools that had trust and I've been in ones that didn't. So um, I'm going to make it really broad and say a culture of trust. Well, it, it's a, we do know that it's a, you build trust in a lot of different ways, but that it is work. So you have to, you have to work at it, right? So Cheryl, what about you? Um, I would start building that trust, Sue, by making sure that all children have their basic needs met. Are they fed? Do they have access to dental care? Are they healthy? Um, are we taking care of those things so that we're not mistaking a hungry child for an angry child or a defiant child? And we're not mistaking a child with an abscess tooth who is rolling desks over for a child who was willfully disobedient and a threat to public school and disruption. You know, are we meeting those basic needs? Um, because as we know, a lot of children who are living in traumatic circumstances and who are truly, truly traumatized, they do not have their basic needs met. So how are we leveling the ground, meeting those basic needs to start to build trust between us and the students and the families and the communities? That's great, thank you. And that, that goes to that phrase that we hear often in Georgia, um, behavior is communication. And so what, are the, what is that child telling you? Layla, what about you? And then we do, we, we have a couple of questions, so we'll get a chance to go to those. I'm gonna do a shameless plug. It would be free your feels. Uh, <laughs> so we have a mental health awareness campaign where we partnered with Voices for Georgia's Children and developed a very, very, very uh, wonderful tool uh, and resource here, I'll drop the link. Um, in the chat room, but for your feels, uh, it's to speak, listen, and to connect. So it's to empower young people to speak about their feelings fearlessly. It's to encourage young adults, their peers, their parents, their teachers to listen judgment-free. And it's to connect them to the necessary resources, supports, and programs that we have across our state of Georgia. So first, we've got to let them speak. Um, we've got to listen to our young people. We've got to give them a platform. If you listen to them, they'll tell you exactly what they need and how to give it to them. Um, the third thing is we can't be judgmental across the culture, across the age, across the ethnicity, because every person is a person and deserves to be treated fairly. So we've got to come through it with those different lenses and not have, again, another cookie cutter approach. And then connect them to all of the great things that we are doing. On the Free Your Fields website, there's three buckets of resources. There's a bucket for youth, there's a bucket for um, caregivers and parents, there's a bucket for teachers and administrators. And in there, there's resources from zero to 26. We've met with DECAL, we've met with DOE, we've met with um, some of our wonderful organizations in our community, and they helped us build this uh, uh, campaign. So it's not just for us, it's for everyone. We want you to take the campaign and start having free your field Fridays, have a dance party. Every Friday, I am freeing my fields because I made it through another week <laughs> at DBHDD and I survived. <laughs> and DOE because I sit as a mental health liaison. So I work with two state agencies. So I survived the week. We've got to think that about our children. Celebrate that week, celebrate that moment. Every moment is not going to be the same. You don't have to let that moment determine your life. Celebrate the small, small things with the children inside the classrooms, and you'll see just how far it goes. I tell my children all the time, the small things matter. 
And we've got to remember that with our children, saying I love you, saying I'm here for you, saying I'm listening to you and really be listening to them goes a long way. So within our schools, within our homes, within our classrooms, within our churches, within our community, we've got to listen to them and be able to be ready to support them where they need it, like Cheryl said. Thank you, Layla. So free your feels, everybody. And Layla, I'm going to count that as your call to action too, if that's okay with you. Um, sure. so, so we've got, <laughs> we've got like two minutes left. There's a couple questions and I definitely, we're going to have to do kind of a rapid fire call to action. So Cheryl, Sue, get ready. What do you want folks to go out and do? But before we do that, let's, uh, let's look at a couple of these questions. There's one from Christina Lee, um, real specific. Do the MPH report statistics by county affect funding by county? Um, Cheryl, are you, do you know what she's asking? Can you answer that question? Um, I don't, so, I'm not sure what she's referring to. She's got another question. Um, and so maybe Christina Lee, can you write down what, what MPH report is? And that, that will be helpful. Uh, her other question is post COVID programs, um, that funding, I guess, for those programs, are they going to, are there going to be programs available for all Georgia public schools? Or is it going to be like an apex thing where schools have to kind of reach out and access that funding? Uh, because it, COVID is, has impacted schools and school districts so differently, depending on where you are and what the impact's been, um, that's going to look different at every local level. I'm not aware of any, I'm not sure what specific post-COVID program she's, she's speaking to, but um, each community, each district, each school is going to be able to tailor uh, what they need to fit their community. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we've just got a minute left. Just rapid fire. All right, Sue, what do you want folks to go out and do? today? What can they do? I want folks to go out and do today is get to know their local legislators, get to know them, really know them. Call your local legislator, go see them, whatever it takes. Thanks. So what about you, Cheryl? Get to know your legislators and advocate for making sure kids are fed and healthy. I, here's mine. So mine is start, just ask questions. Um, the questions are the beginning of every form of advocacy. So ask questions. You can go to our website. Uh, you can go look at the help guides on our website. They will have at the end of the help guides is a series of help guides on school-based behavioral health, APEX, um, PTAs, um, school climate committee, local school climate committees. And they'll provide you with some questions that you can start to begin those conversations. You can go into your school and you could say, what, what school climate reform efforts are you doing? What kind of behavioral health services? What kind of, and just start the conversation. So just some questions, just go out and ask questions and that moves people. Um, great, well, this has been a tremendous conversation. It's such a pleasure always to spend time with, with y'all. And there's so much history here. You're, you're all three of you are so important to the state um, and the children of this state. And I just, I wanna thank you. Um, for me personally, it's always it's always so moving and and humbling to spend time with with all three of you and the Carter Center. Thank you, Eve. Thank you um, for your leadership on this issue as well. So everybody, um, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Michael, Layla, Sue, Cheryl, y'all are all great colleagues. Thanks for a wonderful conversation. And although I wasn't asked what my point of action would be or what I would want, I'm going to tell everybody anyway, because I get to do that because I'm the MC. And um, that is that each one of us in our community need to find a community partner for our schools to implement some of these tier one services. Um, what a great thing for a small um, community organization, women's club to help a school implement free your fear feels in that community. So that's my wish. All right, thanks again for a great panel. Um, what we're gonna do right now is um, take a break for the next 15 minutes. And again, I hope you'll enjoy the music and also um, continue celebrating with us, Mrs. Carter's 50 years of advocacy work. See you back promptly at two o'clock for our final session and a topic that is near and dear to my heart for sure.
Welcome back everybody to the final conversation of the 25th Georgia Mental Health Forum. This is a topic that is really near and dear to my heart as a geriatric nurse practitioner and psych clinical nurse specialist. In order to uphold the Georgia guardianship law, advances in processes and the use of evidence-based assessment tools that provide some standardization and consistency to, to the assessment and help ensure adequate support while preserving the individual rights of Georgians is truly necessary. Progress is being made in this area in Georgia. The next conversation will address what is the Georgia guardianship process and what it is not, and a new tool that the Carter Center and the Fuqua Center for Late Life Depression in collaboration with the state have worked on, and a supported decision-making project that the Georgia Advocacy Organization has been working on as well. Again, if you have questions during this session, please enter them into the chat. And I'm gonna kick us off um, by hearing from Honorable Susan Tate, retired probate court judge of Clark County, who is a remarkable advocate for the rights of persons she has served as a probate court judge over many years. Hi. My name is Susan Tate. I'm the former probate judge of athens Clark County, recently retired. I'm very glad to be involved in the Carter Center Guardianship Project and happy to be here with you virtually. Guardianship of the person and conservatorship of the property of a person, collectively, which I'll call guardianship, constitutes one of the most serious governmental actions involving a person's life that there is in this country. Creating a guardianship or conservatorship takes away a person's rights to decide matters about which they have some of their most deeply held personal beliefs. That's why the standard of proof is much higher in these cases than it is in a normal civil case in which the standard is preponderance of the evidence. In a guardianship case, petitioners must prove their case by clear and convincing evidence. The law also requires that a judge who establishes a guardianship must fashion an order which allows the ward the maximum degree of self-reliance and independence possible within their functional abilities and limitations. The reality is that too often, none of the lawyers or parties in the guardianship hearing bring up the idea of limiting the guardianship in some way or trying an alternative. In my 24 years as probate judge, I was often the only person in the room asking questions about a person's functional abilities, since the evidence would otherwise be focused solely on his or her functional limitations. Across the state, guardianships are rarely limited, even though they are supposed to be narrowly tailored, just as necessary to address the risk involved. Guardianships can be good if they keep the person and their property safe and if they make the person feel safer. But for some, the loss of control is a huge stressor. For others, it can be devastating. Creating a guardianship prematurely or unnecessarily may damage a person's sense of well-being, actually decrease their safety, and may even shorten their life. It may lead to the loss of independent functioning, despite the fact that the law imposes a duty on the guardian or conservator to preserve, encourage, and cultivate the ward's functioning ability. Although courts and lawyers do our best to protect the rights of each person who comes before us, and our guardianship law is set up to achieve that goal, there are some cases which are especially difficult. You may know that teasing out whether someone's problems are due to dementia, mental illness, dehydration, or medications can be very tricky. Determining whether there are certain parts of their life the proposed ward may still be able to manage without any problem when a person still has some of their wits about them is, as I've said, often a neglected area of inquiry. These are the types of situations in which this new tool, a certain battery of tests and a more detailed report form, will be immensely helpful. What we judges need in evaluators' reports is more specificity regarding the facts underlying the conclusions. 
What were the evaluator's observations or the proposed ward's responses to questions or other tests which led the evaluator to the conclusions reached? Was the person's thinking organized? Were they coherent? Could their mental confusion be a medication issue? Is this memory loss only? Or is, for example, their demonstrated decline in executive functioning? These are the main types of questions we hope to see answered with this new battery of tests in report form. There may possibly be other, more nuanced information arising from this project, which might go even further toward ensuring that we are giving people the best foundation possible for living out their lives in happiness, peace, and comfort. Thank you so much, Judge Tate. You've been a huge help in this project. We can't uh, thank you enough. At this time, I would really like to um, introduce and welcome my um, other panel members, Dwan Grooms, Protection and Placement Specialist, Division of Aging Services, Georgia Department of Human Services, and Julie Kegley, Senior Staff Attorney, Program Director for Georgia Advocacy Office. Um, Dwan and Julie, I'd like to kick off this conversation um, with a personal story. Um, about 10 years ago, I began to, um, was charged to increase services for older adults in the community, psychiatric services for older adults. Thought that the way we could do this is that we would provide in-home services by a nurse practitioner, licensed clinical social worker. Um, because we knew for sure with all our work in aging services that transportation continued to be a difficulty um, for many older adults. It was clear to me um, that a lot of older adults who had histories of mental illness or who did not have histories of mental illness but were having starting to have cognitive problems um, were falling out of service, becoming physically ill, and also mentally ill because of their isolation. Um, there were lots of human services available out there. Um, many referrals would be made, but time and time again, that older adult would refuse the service, <laughs> not out of the door, <laughs> not pull the food cooler in to their home or fire another home service provider, saying, asking them never to come back again to their home. I brought this up to my colleagues in aging services um, and many other colleagues. And of course there was great concern regarding this. However, there was this, always this kind of um, sense, well, these folks have a right to folly. And what I, I said, right to folly, I don't understand that. Well, they have rights to make decisions. They, can't, they can make decisions just because decisions are not good decisions. Um, people have right to make decisions. And it was quite clear to me as a nurse practitioner that people were having decision-making capacity issues, whether it was because of their chronic mental illness or the instability of their mental illness at that time, or because they were starting to have cognitive decline. And really the system had no way um, of um, no standardization or consistency and how these people were being um, really cared for. And I was astounded at the amount of resources that we were using in placing more and more services into a facility. And I was um, struck once at a geriatric psychiatry conference where a colleague of mine, Jason Schillerstrom, who Amy Stowe and I then soon after brought into Georgia to help talk with us about how we could add some standardization um, and he gave an example of how he did testing. Um, and I'm not a proponent of comparing older adults to children, but there are different developmental stages. And we do wax and wane often, regardless of what the um, reason is, whether it's developmental or an illness or cognitive challenges or brain injury. But it's talked about how he, in, how he, um, evaluated his nine-year-old who he had to tell to take a bath every night 
to do his homework and to do these things and had it to su support him in his decision making. Um, and then how he used the tool that he used in APS services, Adult Protective Services in Texas, and how many of his um, clients that he was called in had a similar scoring um, on that testing as his nine-year-old son did. And I was just, I thought, wow, we would never put a nine-year-old in an apartment by themselves and send services to the door, deliver a meal and walk away, or send someone a note that they've never met before to the, to the room to help them with their bathing or cleaning, or jump in a cab with somebody they've never met before. And I thought they're really, we owe it to these folks, um, these older adults and persons with severe mental illness in our community to really assess their ability um, to make decisions. Um, and whether it's a progressing decline in cognition or whether it's a temporary because of illness. And as Dr. I mean, as um, probate court judge Tate said, um, a physical illness like dehydration or delirium caused from a sleeping medication or something of that nature. So I won't belabor the point. But this is what got me on this soapbox. And I have to recognize Amy Stowe, who I know was in the audience last uh, yesterday, um, attorney um, who has child protective service background, but also was with Division of Aging Services. Hey, Amy. Um, and it became our charge. And we started like at every meeting we went to talking about how could we improve this system? And we began to talk to probate court judges and ask what kinds of supports and help they might need. Um, so this is where this topic comes from. Um, and Dwan, I think before I um, go on, I think it would be helpful for you to um, share your perspective um, of the guardianship process in Georgia and also kind of what guardianship is and isn't, because there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about that. Well, hi, Eve. I'm happy to do that. Again, my name is Dewan Grooms. I work with the Division of Aging Services under the Department of Human Services in the state of Georgia. And as she said, I'm in the public guardianship office. As far as guardianship in the state of Georgia, guardianship determines that a person needs assistance in making decisions due to lacking capacity. Um, and, and make important decisions about his or her safety. So that is one of the things that is very important to me. Um, and what guardianship is, it's, 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 um, it's a process. And as Judge Tate said, it is a process to where, you know, it's a very important process because someone's rights are being taken away and their, their right to marry, their right to enter a, enter a contract. So this is not a process that I, I would say you should enter into lightly and it needs to be needed and not just for, you know, a certain period of time and, and if possible needs to be limited. But that process is, you know, initially a petition needs to be filed. The petition needs to be filed in the, in the county where the person resides. And then comes the important part, uh, uh, an evaluation. And this is what, what I think this tool will really help with. This quarter appointed evaluation weighs a whole lot um, to the probate court judges. This evaluation, um, a person is sent out and they interview the person and find out you know, everything they need to know about them because this is going, because a hearing is going to happen and they have to present evidence. Uh, both sides have to present evidence of why a guardian should be appointed. Um, the, in that evidence, um, a guardian ad litem is appointed also to kind of speak uh, uh, what they think would be best for the person. Um, also evidence is presented whether a person needs a guardian or doesn't need a guardian. And then the judge takes that evidence and makes that important decision on whether a guardian needs to, needs to be appointed. Um, and, and that decision is not entered into lightly. And, that's when our department steps in. We stepped in, steps in, and our main function as 
we're surrogate decision making. I like to say that the easiest way to put it, we make their legal and medical decisions. We are their advocate. And then we also coordinate and monitor services um, that they have in the home. Some of the things that you know we provide, we assist in, in, in finding living arrangements. We schedule medical appointments. We arrange transportation. We ensure that their needs are met. We monitor the services in licensed homes. And we try to find them the appropriate resources that they need. And some of the things that I think some of the misconceptions about what guardianship doesn't provide, we do not do involuntary commitment. Uh, we don't um, physically control or restrain. We can't prevent, you know, chronic drug use or alcohol abuse. Um, we can't control uh, communication or who visits the person. We can't change bad behavior. Um, we can't control or, 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 or say whether they need to stay in a locked facility. And we can't force medications and force nutrition. So you, you have to think about these things that, that we can't do, but in the role of what we can do, we try to work within those parameters, but also keeping in mind of talking to the person, finding out what their needs, what their desires are, and, and how we can work to keep them safe, but also make sure that we're not stepping on their toes and violating their rights in, in making these important decisions that we're tasked to do by the probate court. Right. Thank you so much, Dwan. And um, before I spend any time talking about the decision-making capacity tool that we are currently piloting in the state of Georgia, Julie, I'd love to hear more um, or hear about the supported decision-making project that GAO has been engaged in. Okay, thank you, Eve, and thank you, Dwan. Um, my name is Julie Cagney. I'm with the Georgia Advocacy Office. And about 10 years ago, I started getting phone calls from people under guardianship saying that they wanted their guardian removed. And that was not something that I had looked into before. But as I kept getting these cases and kept working on these cases, it was striking to me how easy it was to put somebody under guardianship and how hard it is to remove the guardianship. And I looked around, you know, the other attorneys in the state and nobody was really practicing this type of law to remove the guardianship. And so this was really an area of need, especially for people with disabilities, because it is mostly people with, dis with disabilities and older adults that are going under guardianship. And as the protection and advocacy system for the state of Georgia, we knew that we had to step up and do something. When I started looking into all of this about 10 years ago and where we are now, I just want to throw this fact out. In 1995, there were 500,000 people in the country under a guardianship. That number is now over 1.5 million. So why is guardianship increasing? when we have state hospitals that are closing, when we have the Olmstead integration mandate of people living in the community with appropriate services and support. And there's lots of theory, and I could talk about this all day, but I know I'm supposed to talk about supported decision making. Mm -hmm. So one of the kinds that, that had come out around the country is let's look at less restrictive alternative to guardianship. There are many. You can have a power of attorney, you can have a representative pay you, and there's also supported decision making. And what supported decision making is, is that it's the services and the supports that help a person with a disability make their own decision. And they get that support from their family, their friends, their neighbors, anybody that they trust to help them understand the issue, 
ask questions, and make an informed decision about what to do. The person may not need support in all areas of their life. It may only be with managing money, or it may only be with living arrangement. And the person may not have the same supporter with all of these areas. They can look to the neighbor for help with the money, and they can look to their family for help with deciding where to live. So the Georgia Advocacy Office received a grant to develop and work on supportive decision making as an alternative to guardianship. And there are different supportive decision making agreements that can be done. We don't have one standard form that we promote because each agreement needs to be specific to that individual person and what they need and what kind of support. So when I get done talking, I'm going to put some resources in the chat box for you all to go to for information about supporting decision making. But just, I've started using supporting decision making with my case then with removing guardianship. And it is just so impactful for the probate court judge to hear that this person had to plan for their life. And this is how they're going to live their life. And these are the people that are going to support them. And if those people show up to the court hearing, that is a big plus for the probate court judge because they know we're not making this up that the person had to come in person to the hearing to say, hey, I stand beside this person, I'm going to support them. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate that. Do you have comments, Dwan, and with experience with the supportive decision making? I just totally, I just totally agree. Um, it is so important because, like I said, you know, it is, it is a hard thing for guardianship to happen, but even harder for that to be reversed or someone's rights restored. So I totally agree of, of if we could have some other options before it gets to guardianship, since it's so hard to undo, then that would be so great. So I totally agree. Julie, in your opinion, how what needs to happen to have supported decision-making wider available? I think it's events like this. It's getting the word out. It's letting people know, just like what Judge Tate said, we don't need to go far on with guardianship. We need to be looking at how to limit it. We need to be looking at these options like supportive decision making. So to the extent that we can get in front of probate court judges, the court appointed attorneys, the guardian ad litem, that would be great. The one thing that I will say is that we have a really good relationship with Duane office, the public guardianship office, and, and they totally get what we're all about. Great, yeah. And I think a key to this is um, really having some reliable data <laughs> On, and when I say data, I'm talking about an assessment or data regarding that individual, um, more what people would think is a good medical assessment, neurologic, psychologic medical assessment, so that we really understand having used tools that are evidence-based um, tools and making that decision or having that data to make those, um, to know what kinds of supports and in what kinds of decisions an individual might need some supports. This is how we went about in developing the um, Georgia um, and piloting the decision-making capacity toolkit that's currently being um, tested by five court-appointed court attorney, um, excuse me, evaluators right now. Um, it is just consists of a um, standardized interview um, which helps the evaluator identify um, previous decision-making, 
um, how that person is functioning now, how they've gone about making decisions, what their preferences were probably before um, the illness or before the cognitive decline. And then it has um, three assessment tools that are proven to be effective and reliable. And that is one, um, a depression scale, because we know that when persons are depressed, um, they have more difficulty in making decisions in their concentration. Um, then we also have what is called the exit. Um, and it is a neuropsychological screening tool. Again, it's a screening tool that really shows where the decisions a person might be having difficulty um, in their decision-making. Another is called the Montreal um, Cognitive Assessment Tool, which is another tool um, very um, familiar to persons in psychiatry and neurology and assessing also um, decision-making and functional um, func executive function. Um, and then there's the DONR that is often um, used in aging services to really assess the, um, how that person is physically functioning and what they're able to do with them. So you can see with this tool, um, we are providing some consistency um, and also some standardization because we know that these tools provide, um, if, if um, administered to each client, uh, the same way. We also hope that this tool will be extraordinarily helpful in the um, regaining um, a person's or, or leaving the guardianship because you can compare before and after um, if we have the same tool. We were thrilled, um, Amy and I and my colleagues at the Fuqua Center, um, graduate um, um, student Milan, um, Dr. Salam, excuse me, Solange, and, um, and Dr. Laurie Culp, a neuropsychologist in town, were thrilled to learn that we didn't need an act of legislation. To your point, Julie, just greater awareness regarding this tool um, and pick up on, on it from the probate court judges to really um, improve the system dramatically. So we hope that this tool will be um, we'll, in the next couple of months, uh, we'll get the results from our pilot, um, make changes, and then um, begin to educate um, both evaluators, the guardianship office, DBHDD, um, and um, probate court judges regarding this tool, have the opportunity. Yes. Duan, what do you think um, are some low hanging fruit, if you will, that the community could do or be of assistance in um, uh, preserving the rights and limiting the guardian, limiting our need for guardianship in the state of Georgia? Well, I think the low hanging fruit were just being involved um, as we do on the back end, being an advocate on the front end. Um, just speaking for the person, finding out what their needs are and trying to find out what services that can be surrounding the person before it gets to the point of someone filing for guardianship. That would be um, a, a wonderful thing to happen. Yeah. Julie, what will be the next steps for the supported decision-making work at GAO? It will be to collect stories of people with disability that have been able to use supported decision making both as a way to deflect guardianship and to get out of guardianship. There are some states around the country that have been passing legislation to where supported decision making should be considered by the probate court judges in the state as an alternative, but we're not there. You know, we're still in the process of gathering the data to see how this works. And it does work. <laughs> we're, we're still in that stage of gathering the data as well. But um, it is clear to me that the Carter Center, Fuqua Center, 
um, needs to be working with GAO because it does seem that these two tools could go hand in hand in improving and um, really providing a service to um, Georgia citizens. I'd like to um, open the floor up to any questions comments or um, stories that anybody might want to share. Gotten to the end of the day here, so. Eve, I would like to say my favorite part of my job is when one of my clients get their rights restored. That is the favorite part of my job. Um, that is so rewarding um, to see that change and that excitement um, that, you know, they have that control back. They have their lives back. Um, because guardianship, you know, as, it's, as I said, it, it can be intrusive. It is intrusive. Um, so that is the, the best part of my job. And I actually have uh, an interview tomorrow morning at nine o'clock with a client that, that I'm excited because I'm pretty sure she's going to get her rights restored and, and she deserves that. What a great story, Dwan. And I have to say what I um, really look forward to seeing is that limited guardianship um, becoming more and more um, um, available to people. And it's clear in working with um, Judge Tate that this um, information that's provided in a consistent and standardized way will help in making those decisions because it will, it will really help um, uh, the family uh, um, or community members or the probate court judge members um, hone in on just what the supports are that that person could use. Perhaps they need supports with managing their money, but that doesn't mean that they can't vote or that they can't marry or that they can't, um, you know, remain living independently um, because they can do other things as well. So, yeah. And one of, one of my favorite stories is when, um, I won't say the name of the county, but it was a vice restoration case. And the judge was so excited about this case. She restored the person's rights. And then she came down off the bench and gave my client a hug and was just so excited that this person, you know, no longer had to live with the guardian. Um, and then another story, if we have time, is there was a gentleman who, he's living with mental illness, and he had been in and out of a state hospital over 20 times. And his parents were his guardian. And when I met him, he was living by himself on his own. He had two different jobs. He was doing everything himself. Like, I didn't see a reason, and I didn't know why he had a guardian. So we get everything ready. We file the petition for vice restoration. We go in front of the judge, and the parents were opposed, you know, to them being removed as guardian. And the judge said what Dwan said earlier, guardian can't control behavior. There is just no way that guardian can control behavior. And the judge said, that may have been his behavior in the past, but I've got to go based upon what I'm seeing right now. And what I'm seeing right now is a hardworking young man living on his own, working to job. This man does not need a guardian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I have similar stories, Julie, where uh, we talk about how just, and I think I alluded to this earlier when uh, in the opening is that um, bad decisions don't mean pathology, and, but how you, we do we um, allow people to make decisions, but also make sure that we're um, providing um, the supports and the services and the safety that individuals need and that we really know what their capacity is to make those decisions. 
I'm not seeing. Um, thank you, Dylan, for your nice compliment. Um, I don't see. Um, let's see. So there's a question, how can we make sure that all individuals with public guardians are connected to all necessary community supports like ACT teams, Medicaid waivers, so that they can live in the community instead of institutions like nursing homes? I can say when we're involved, that that's one of the things that we always tell the case managers, because one of our roles is to monitor supports. So we are always trying to surround the client with as many supports as possible um, so they can be successful. We are always trying to set them up to be successful. So we're trying to surround them with as many supports that we can find that we are aware of. So I, I am always trying to attend different conferences to find out more information um, and to uh, have interdisciplinary teams to make sure that I know what other resources are out there so we can make sure those resources are passed along to the case managers that manages those cases. Dwan, I, I may be wrong, but um, where Georgia has a fairly large number of wards of the state in comparison to other states. Is that, is, do I remember that correctly? And that's not to throw anybody under the bus, because what I think that does is that we're cautious and we want to care for people and make sure that they aren't, that they have that surrogate help. Um, so yeah, not to put you in an awkward situation, but. I don't have that data, but I believe you are correct. Um, I have heard that mentioned, but I, I have not seen that data, but I believe you are correct. Yeah. So it has to be. I mean, again, we're 51 and 51 here in social services and mental health supports. It becomes a num bit of a numbers game as well. Everyone that works in your office is there for a reason because they want to provide that service. But when there's so many people, my real hope is that if we can provide limited guardianship, uh, supported decision um, making so that guardianship is not necessary, these kinds of things, we can um, um, balance it and provide better service for everybody. Um, Dylan asks, I wonder if there's anything that employers can be doing to support people in this situation. Well, I can take. Go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Julie. Okay. Um, I would think absolutely the fact that a person that's under guardianship is working, that's a big step in the right direction. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. And so if the employer can talk to the person and say, hey, have you ever thought about not being under guardianship? You can, the employer can refer the person to my office and we would be happy to help. Yeah. What also comes to mind with that question, and I think it came up in our school-based behavioral health, is creating um, an environment of trust. Um, a lot of people are not going to share um, their situation um, openly and honestly if they feel that they'll be stigmatized or um, assumptions will be made regarding their capabilities in other ways, just as Julie says, and their ability to do the work that they, are, they come to do every day. So I think creating an environment, being very open about the supports through HR that are available to people um, and again, creating that trusted environment. That often requires people in these situations to share their stories. And we so appreciate all those folks, uh, including our Respect Institute um, person at the very beginning, sharing their story. So people um, becomes more, more normalized. All right, any other questions? How important is it to support the unpaid family givers in Georgia? Great question. I, no, I think that, 
I think that, that is extremely, extremely important. Um, because like I said, if you're trying to surround the person with supports, then we, we need to support the person that's providing the care. And even though that a person is under guardianship in our department, sometimes that they're, they're still living with family. So we're trying to surround that family with, with supports also. Maybe that's not the main reason we're there, but then that they're in the home. So we need to surround them with supports also. I agree. And I think a lot of times the unpaid family members, they, are the, they get so burned out big time. Mm -hmm. But they're torn. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place because they don't want to make, leave their loved one hanging. And, and the last thing we need is for the system to break down so completely that the person ends up in some kind of vicinity. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, we have got to be providing support to the family. Yeah. Again, very similar to our conversations about children and families at risk and providing the supports, definitely the same with families that are caring for persons with disability, severe persistent mental illness, um, and cognitive decline. We've got to be innovative in this area. Um, it's far uh, more economical and maintains the um, family unit, those folks that um, love and are connected to that individual. We can't get them to the point, as Julie says, where they're so burned out, they just can't do it anymore and take care of themselves. I've heard family members say that. I, I, my, my health is so suffered or my husband that I can't any longer take care of. Um, my son, I need somebody else to do this. So really good point. Last, we need to finish up in the next three um, minutes, but um, any innovations that would be helpful? Well, I would actually go back to your tool. Um, when I start reading this tool, I really got excited because it, it actually gives something tangible and something measurable for the evaluator to use in front of the probate court judges. So to me, that this, this is, this to me, this is an innovation for what I do every day. Yeah. And I say the same thing too, with around the um, supported decision-making. I mean, that's, it's just obvious. <laughs> how do we, how do we formalize that and standardize that as the first place um, that we go um, before we even ever consider guardianship? I think we need to shift in our paradigm and how we think about caring for our um, neighbors and citizens. So thank you all so very much for participating um, in this conversation. Um, thank you for the work you do every day. Appreciate it. Thank you thank for you participating in the you, forum. Julie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, Georgia Mental Health Forum participants, as we move to winding up what I think has really been a great two days, um, I would like you to take three minutes to reflect on the day using our head, heart, and hand, an exercise that colleagues have shared with us that we think will be a really great way to wind up the day. So in your chat, pull up your chat. If it's not already up, please. Please take a minute and put in the chat a reflection from your head. What are you thinking right now regarding what you've heard in the last two days? You might have to pull your chat back up as we showed the screen. My, my chat box went away and I need to pull it to the side. Can others please 
What are you thinking? Then I'd like you to put in the chat, what are you feeling about the last two days? Again, from your heart, what are you feeling regarding the last two days? And finally, please reflect on what you can do with your hands. What do you want to do after the last three days? two days, excuse me. And please share this in the chat. Please continue to think about these. Um, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? What do you want to do? We greatly appreciate your participation over the last two years in the 25th Georgia Mental Health Forum. Thanks for helping us celebrate 50 years of Mrs. Carter's mental health advocacy. Um, we look forward to next year, this time, and being in person back at the Carter Center. So I'd like to close by introducing to you my boss, Dr. Kashif Ijaz, Vice President for Health Programs at the Carter Center, to provide a few closing remarks. Thank you all. Dear friends, before we adjourn, I'd like to thank you for attending the 25th annual Rosalind Carter Georgia Mental Health Forum. I appreciate your enthusiastic participation in this event, even though it was held in a virtual forum. It is especially important that we gather together to address issues that affect the mental health of Georgians because we have spent so much time far apart from each other since the COVID-19 pandemic struck. It has taken a toll on everyone, mentally and sometimes physically. Also, the reckoning with racial injustice weighs heavily on our minds. Now, more than ever, it is vital for us to discuss how we can work together to ensure that we, through our work and advocacy with policymakers, prioritize behavioral health and increase access to services. Here are some of my takeaways from the two days of discussion. We need to embrace the um, concept of population health, which includes prevention, promotion, and recovery. We also need to address conditions such as housing, transportation, and employment, and intentionally address racism. There is a need to transform systems and integrate care to impact whole person health. We need to dedicate adequate resources to ensure people receive the services and support when they need it and where they need them. There's also a need to establish common goals and advance them through federal, state, and local policy change. It has been an informative and energizing two days filled with information about what people and organizations are doing to transform mental health and substance use systems so that we can improve the lives of all Georgians. I want to thank you for your participation and wish you well as you continue working on these important efforts. I also want everybody to stay safe and enjoy the remaining year. And let's hope that next year when we meet, we are able to meet person to person in a 3D format. Thank you very much.